Please take your seats. We do now come to our last session of this very interesting conference. I want again to thank our Moroccan hosts for the warm welcome that we have shown us. Your hospitality has meant not only that we benefit from enriching discussions during the day, but enjoy pleasant follow-up conversations amid lovely surroundings as well. I also thank our guest speakers for coming to our meeting today and taking time out of your busy schedules to share your experience with us. Before I pass the floor to our expert speakers, I would like to take a few minutes to remind us all of the OSCE's history related to our topic today, combating intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief. Freedom of religion and belief has been high on the OSCE's ag agenda since the earliest days. Indeed, respect for the freedom of thought, conscience, religion or belief, and respect for the individual's right to profess and practice religion or belief was a critical part of the Helsinki Final Act's famous Decalogue of Principles. Then OSCE heads of states met again in 1999 in Istanbul they made the dangers of violation of these freedoms of religion and belief perhaps even more clear. They are security threats, they declared. At the heart of this topic is, of course, the understanding of fundamental equality of women, men and children. This means countries has the, have the responsibility to respect and protect the freedom to believe, as well as the freedom to not believe. And naturally, this also means that both individuals and communities enjoy the right to change their belief system. No individual shall be harassed, bullied, violated, suppressed, or even killed because of their belief or non-belief. I am proud that our Parliamentary Assembly has repeatedly and consistently spoken out against intolerance and in favour of respect. Many concrete recommendations have been put forward in our declarations, but today I will just highlight two from our most recent work. In Luxembourg, a few month, months ago, we urged, and I quote, all members of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly and national parla parliaments to create a coalition of respect by publicly speaking out against hate speech and other manifestations of intolerance." End of quote. Such proactive steps are an important way not only to keep this question high on our agenda, but actually serve as a way to counteract intolerance narratives. I think that today's meeting is also effectively implementing our recommendation to, and I quote, make use of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly to share best practices and experiences in counteracting these phenomena of intolerance, end of quote. So please share your experience, dear colleagues. I would also like to remind all participants here today of another recommendation from our Luxembourg Declaration, in which we called on national parliaments to oversee the full integration of, and I quote, human rights education into primary and secondary school curricula with the aim of promoting long-term respect for human rights concepts and commitments, end of quote. And of course, we need to take practical steps to combat manifestations of intolerance happening today. But integrating tolerance perspectives into our school curricula is a forward-looking approach that can have much more far-reaching positive impact. 
Dear colleagues, I will now ask our guest speakers to share their experience and expertise with us so that we can inform our debates. I will ask each speaker to keep their remarks to not more than approximately 10 minutes. Unfortunately, His Excellency Mr. Ahmed Tufik, Minister of Religious Endowments and Islamic Affairs of the Kingdom of Morocco, was unable to attend this meeting today. But we have two excellent speakers on the panel. And we will now hear a presentation by Mr. Mohamed Belkibir, a director of the Study and Research Center on Values at the Mohammedia League of Moroccan Ulama. The work of this organization could not be more appropriate for our discussion today. Founded by King Mohammed VI, it is a council of religious scholars and part of Morocco's counter-terrorism efforts. I understand that it is particularly changed, charged with training a new generation of Islamic scholars and imams to advocate religious tolerance and prevent the spread of radical Islamism. Mr. Mohammed Belkibir, we look forward to hearing about your work, and you have the floor. You can, will you use the... the Bonjour. J'attends la, la présentation. Une présentation qui a été donnée au corrigé PowerPoint. Bon, bonjour tout le monde, c'est avec plaisir que je contribue avec vous dans cette rencontre illumineuse concernant le, 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 la discussion autour d'une problématique assez importante qui est l'extrémisme et le radicalisme. C'est un plaisir pour moi et c'est un honneur, mais c'est une responsabilité aussi parce que je me trouve devant différentes connaissances, différentes expertises. C'est anormal que je me sens un peu euh, perturbé. Et je commence tout d'abord de se demander le, à, concernant le dialogue interreligieux. Lorsqu'on parle de dialogue interreligieux, donc il faut qu'on se demande de quoi s'agit-il. Donc c'est l'ensemble de relations interreligieuses positives euh, et constructives avec des personnes et des communautés d'autres confessions religieuses, donc autour de plusieurs religions, et c'est l'entendement entre ces, ces différentes religions et différentes cultures. Donc c'est pour se disposer à entrer et en conversation et discussion pour acquérir un nouvel apprentissage. Lorsqu'on se trouve en, dans un dialogue interreligieux ou interculturel, donc c'est un, un enrichissement pour les, les, les personnes qui se dialoguent, pour les gens qui se trouvent autour d'une euh, problématique ou euh, d'un fait ou d'un événement euh, différent. Donc on le voit de plusieurs côtés, de plusieurs options. Donc on est devant ce cette problématique pour qu'on puisse finalement le, le résoudre, la résoudre et trouver la, la solution. Donc, je présente ici un événement témoignage de mon pays concernant cette, ce dialogue interreligieux ouvert. C'est euh, en, en, euh, en 1985 que le... Euh, voilà. Ah, le rouge... Non. 
lorsque le pape Jean-Paul II se trouvait au Maroc, et avant qu'il vienne au Maroc, il se demandait, en, en posant la question au feu sa majesté le roi Hassan II, en disant « Serre, monsieur, que je ferai-je si je, si je vis au Maroc ?»« Je ne pourrai pas prier avec les gens, puisque votre État est purement un État musulman. » La réponse de sa majesté Hassan II, c'était « Sainteté, vous avez une responsabilité » qui est non seulement une responsabilité religieuse, mais aussi éducative et morale. Donc, les, les, les dialogues religieux ne sont pas des dialogues centrés toujours sur la religion, mais aussi centrés sur d'autres problèmes que vit l'humanité. Donc, c'est pour cela que qu'on a ouvert, dès le début, dans le siècle dernier, cette, cette porte euh, avec le, le dialogue culturel et les dialogues religieux avec d'autres euh, confessions. Donc, si, euh, et pour répondre à, cette, à cet appel, à cette invitation, le 19 août 1985, Jean-Paul II s'adressait dans le stade de Casablanca devant 90 000 jeunes musulmans en les appelant pour la première fois « mes frères ». Cet événement a renforcé le dialogue interreligieux par d'autres manifestations. Pourquoi les dialogues euh, euh, interreligieux et interculturels Donc on, faut, on se demande quels sont les objectifs. Le premier objectif, c'est réduire les dangers du millénaire et promouvoir l'accès universel à l'humanité pour un bien-être humain. Et faire face au comportement destructif de la civilisation universelle développée à travers les âges. Nous sommes tous responsables de cette civilisation qui a, qui a été développé par nos ancêtres, et nous sommes tous communs, et nous, nous sommes tous responsables de cette responsabilité, de la durée de cette, responsa, de cette civilisation. Si nous avons laissé la, cette civilisation se détruire à cause de l'absence de nos dialogues, donc on est responsable non pas responsable seulement sur ce temps-là, mais responsable devant les personnes qui viennent par la suite, nos enfants et nos, nos petits-enfants et toutes les, 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 les générations qui viennent par la suite. Et aussi, c'est contribuer dans le processus visant d'instaurer les rêves, toujours nous rêvons, nous rêvons malgré l'apogée, malgré le, ce qu'on a assuré et ce qu'on a euh, élaboré de, de bien pour l'humanité, on est toujours devant des rêves, la paix totale, la tolérance totale, l'amour universel, la beauté, l'amitié, la fraternité, la vérité, le vivre ensemble. Ce sont toujours des rêves pour nous. Contribuer avec des dialogues interculturels et, et interreligieux, nous pouvons arriver à, à instaurer ces rêves et à les concrétiser et concevoir et analyser la réalité selon des approches scientifiques. Normalement, il ne faut pas se centrer sur la religion, parce qu'il y a parfois on trouve des religieux qui sont obscurantistes, donc il ne faut pas se centrer sur la religion, purement religion, mais il faut essayer de comprendre et d'interpréter les religions selon les sciences humaines, selon les sciences, les sciences exactes. Il faut introduire aussi la philosophie, et pour cela pour élaborer le diagnostic réel de notre état de lieu mondial. Nous, à l'Arabita Mohamed de Oulama, qui est une institution religieuse, à caractère religieux, ouvert sur toutes les pensées, ouvert sur toutes les confessions, on a instauré une approche pour la, la, la bonne compréhension de la religion, pour contrer l'extrémisme. Le, euh, et le terrorisme. L'extrémisme et le terrorisme qui sont fondés sur la mal compréhension de la religion, il faut les bien contrer avec une bonne compréhension de la religion, surtout la religion musulmane. Parfois, il y a une explication et interprétation détournée, erronée de, de, de certains euh, ver, versets coraniques ou de, de certains hadiths euh, prophétiques. Pour dire que les violences 
l'extrémisme, l'extrémisme violent, le, le, la misogynie, sont tous, des, sont tous des comportements dus à la mal interprétation de la religion. Et je vous donne des exemples, je vous donne des, je, je, je vais présenter des exemples en fin de euh, cette présentation, parce que je n'ai pas assez le temps, de temps. Voyez avec moi c est, c est, c est, c est cette mal interprétation de la religion. On trouve dans un verset coranique, dans Al Imran, le verset 85, Quiconque recherche une autre religion que l'islam, il ne sera pas accepté de lui et dans l'autre monde, il sera parmi les perdants. Si nous lisons ce verset coranique, ça veut dire que l'islam, il faut qu que tout le monde, que toute personne soit musulmane. Sinon, il n'est pas accepté par Dieu. C est, c est, ce, ce, ce verset coranique, il est, il, est, il est interprété de cette façon par les extrémistes. Mais, si vous voyez avec moi l'avant verset coranique, la, la, le verset coranique 84, nous avons cru en Allah, en ce qui nous fit révéler et révéler à Abraham, Ismaïl, Isaac, Jacob et les tribus, et en ce qui fit donner à Moïse, Jusé et les prophètes de la part de leur Seigneur, nous ne faisons entre eux aucune distinction et à lui nous sommes soumis. Nous pouvons conclure de, cette, de ce verset coranique que l'islam a deux sens. Un sens particulier, c'est l'islam, la, la, la religion de Mohammed, et l'islam en arabe, en sens large, ça veut dire la soumission à Dieu. Toute religion monothéiste est un islam. Donc, il n'y a pas de distinction. Donc, cette, ce verset explique le, 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 le premier verset qui euh, ignore toutes les religions, qui dînent toutes les religions qui ne sont pas des, des religions islamiques. Vous voyez que l'islam en arabe, ça ne veut pas dire l'islam en sens musulman, mais ça veut dire la soumission à Dieu. Et, ça veut, je, 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 je complète, « Ma kana Ibrahim ou Abraham ne fit ni juif ni chrétien. Il fit un authentique, un pur croyant, et vous voyez entre parenthèses, musulman. Musulman, ça veut dire un pur croyant, et il ne fit plus nombre des associateurs ou des associateurs. Donc, lorsqu'on dit l'islam, la religion de l'islam, Abraham était un musulman. Mais Abraham était avant, avant Mohammed. Il n'était ni chrétien, ni musulman. Mais un pur croyant en monothéiste. Mais un, un musulman. Un musulman. Un musulman, une personne soumise à Dieu. Donc, la Rabbi Ta Mohammed, nous essayons de revoir les, les, les textes pour mieux comprendre les textes et mieux faire comprendre aux autres. Je reviens à ce, ce problème d'extrémisme. De, Vous voyez, pour contrer l'extrémisme, il faut identifier deux pôles d'extrémisme, deux, deux groupes. Il y a le groupe des acteurs de terroristes, comme Al-Baghdadi, comme ce sont les pôles, ce sont les concepteurs, les, c'est eux qui tracent l'ingénierie de l'extrémisme. Et il y a un autre pôle qui sont les exécuteurs qui sont les jeunes, qui sont les femmes, et qui sont ces personnes qui ne connaissent pas la religion, et qui qu connaissent la religion à partir de ces extrémistes qui présentent la, leur religion propre à eux. Le, le, la, la puissance, l'énergie de tout mouvement extrémiste, de toute organisation extrémiste, se trouve, dans, chez, euh, se trouve chez les jeunes. Les jeunes constituent la force. Si nous pouvons arriver à, 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 à bien faire comprendre aux jeunes le vrai islam, 
la vraie religion, les, con les concepteurs ne trouvent aucune puissance, aucune force pour euh, rester, pour agir. Et c'est pour cela, l'Arabita Mohamed Ulama, nous travaillons sur la rééducation des jeunes pour leur, leur démontrer la vraie, le vrai islam et la vraie religion. Et nous faisons à partir de nous travaillons pour arriver à ça en tout en se basant sur la méthode de la, la déconstruction du discours radical. Pas la, 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 on ne détruit pas la, 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 la déconstruction, pas la destruction. La déconstruction, c'est-à-dire une analyse profonde, une relecture, une revue profonde de toutes les composantes de la, de discours religieux de ces personnes euh, extrémistes. Et nous essayons de voir cette, ce discours ou cette déconstruction du discours en deux dimensions. La dimension interne et la dimension externe. La dimension interne, c'est-à-dire essayer de, de voir, de faire sortir et révéler le vrai sens des versets coraniques et des hadiths qui sont les composantes de la religion, qui sont les principes. Parce que nous savons que le bonheur, la, fina, la finalité des finalités de, de la religion, c'est le bonheur des humains. Et pour arriver à ce bonheur des humains, on a dans l'islam les intentions, les objectifs de la charia. Et les objectifs sont cinq, et je cite l'essentiel de, ce, de, de cette finalité, des cinq finalités, qui est la préservation de la vie. Si Dieu insiste sur la préservation de la vie, comment accepter de ces extrémistes de tuer les gens Donc c'est un, un, une, une contradiction. Dans les, on se trouve dans une contradiction et l'islam n'accepte pas ça et nous essayons aussi de revoir les textes et ce qu'ils sont mis à leur place lorsqu'on essaie de démontrer ou expliquer ou renforcer ou documenter un, un, un événement est-ce que le verset coranique ou bien le hadith prophétique sont dans leur place nous, et on arrive finalement à trouver que l'extrémisme ni sunnite ni coranique le, le, il, 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 il n'y basé sur aucun, aucun verset coranique ou sur aucun hadith euh, prophétique. Cette déconstruction du discours radical euh, à l'arabita Mohamed et du ulama, nous les avons construits, nous les avons bâtis sur trois composantes. Le premier composant, c'est les supports. On a produit des, 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 des dispositifs méthodo-cognitifs basé sur la méthodologie sur la lecture des schémas cognitifs basé aussi sur le, 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 la communication basé sur l'animation basé sur le, le, toutes les sciences humaines psychologie cognitive, psychologie dynamique et aussi basé sur le contenu du Coran le vrai contenu du Coran le vrai contenu du Hadith le deuxième, la deuxième composante c'est l'élaboration de ce contenu dans des livrets faciles, accessibles. Et le troisième, la troisième composante, c'est la formation des euh, mécanismes des intervenants qui sont les jeunes. Nous disposons de deux types d'intervenants de, 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 à notre euh, euh, organisation qui est l'Arabita Mohamed et Ulama. Nous avons les ulama relais. Un ulama, le, les ulama c'est un alm, un alm c'est un, 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 un connaisseur de la religion. Et vous savez que lorsqu'on parle du ulama, les sommités, et on a des ulama relais, des jeunes sortant des institutions religieuses, comme le département du site islamique, dans 14 facultés à travers le royaume, et on a aussi des institutions à caractère religieux, et nous, 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 nous prenons parmi les sortants, de ces, de ces institutions des personnes et nous le formons. C'est le, le, le premier mécanisme. Pourquoi intermédiaire au relais Parce qu'il se place, il se positionne entre le grand public et surtout le grand public vulnérable, les femmes et les jeunes, et les ulama de la nation, les ulama de la Oumma, la Oumma, la nation. C'est pour cela que nous les appelons ulama relais. Deuxième mécanisme ou deuxième type d'intervenant sont les éducateurs pères, peur educators. Les zones, les zones les, dans, les, dans le, les lycées, dans les collèges, 
Et écoute, madame, à côté de moi, lorsqu'elle a parlé de Norvège, la, la formation, le, les programmes le scolaires, nous étions à l'Arabie de Mohamed. On a mené une visite à Oslo et on a discuté avec le ministère de l'Éducation nationale pour échanger cette expérience marocaine dans les lycées et les collèges. Et nous sommes toujours en discussion pour qu'on puisse faire des échanges entre les élèves, entre les jeunes, les jeunes euh, norvégiens et les jeunes marocains. Si, euh, si, si ce port d'éducation travaille, j'ai ici euh, quelques, si vous voulez, quelques livres ici. nous disposons. Voilà. Voilà. C'est un livret, c'est le premier livret, un premier livret, c'est la déconstruction du discours radical. Un deuxième, un deuxième livret qui est la construction, la déconstruction des concepts jizia. C'est un concept religieux. Troisième c'est la déconstruction des concepts du djihad, parce que le djihad n'est pas déclaré la guerre. Le djihad en arabe, c'est fournir un effort, un effort psychologique, un effort euh, corporal. Ce n'est pas toujours le djihad, c'est la guerre. On trouve le djihad plus de 90 fois dans le Coran et le Hadith, trois fois ou quatre fois, c'est la guerre. Et cela déclaré la guerre quand il y a une personne qui menace. Mais dans toutes les utilisations du jihad, le jihad, c'est fournir toujours, c'est fournir un effort. Le hakimia, le droit, le vrai, le, 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 la déconstruction de déclarer la guerre au nom de Dieu pour euh, faire euh, aider les, les déprimés. Oui. De, un, un, un autre livre sur la déconstruction des concepts de Khilafa, la Khilafa, la succession du prophète, de la Khilafa à l'état moderne, puisque le, 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 les, les, les extrémistes veulent baser leur projet sur le déni de ce qui existe, tout en disant on va revenir sur le vrai islam, pour eux le vrai islam, le, le islam des prophètes. Et pour arriver à cette succession de prophètes qui est la Khilafa, c'est pour cela que vous, trouvez la khilafa, que vous trouvez la Khilafa tient une place très importante dans le discours radical, pour arriver à cette Khilafa, à cette succession de prophètes, donc il faut déclarer la guerre. Et vous voyez qu'il y a tout un, un appareil conceptuel et islamique erroné que nous, nous, nous faisons la déconstruction avec une jeune avec nos, 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 nos jeunes ulama, avec nos jeunes élèves, nos jeunes, élèves, nos jeunes étudiants dans les collèges, dans les lycées, dans les universités, pour qu'on puisse contrer le discours radical. Merci pour votre attention. Thank you, Mr. Belkebia. And um Before we open the floor for our discussion, I am very pleased that we will now hear from His Excellency Ambassador Mehmet Patachi, personal representative of the OSCE chairperson in office on combating intolerance and discrimination against Muslims. Ambassador Patachi has a wealth of both academic and diplomatic experience, including having affiliations with many universities around the world and having served as a Turkish Turkey's ambassador to the Holy See. He is current, his current position working on behalf of the OSCE to combat intolerance make his input for our meeting today particularly re relevant. Ambassador Patachi, thank you for coming today and you have the floor. Thank you. Distinguished participants, good morning. Dear members of parliaments of the OSCE particip participating states, according to independent hate crime reports for 2018, it's an undeniable fact that the discrimination, intolerance, and hate crime cases against Muslims are for 
unfortunately are increasing within the OSCE region. These cases almost doubled in many countries compared to the previous year. Mosques, Muslim community centers, and houses of Muslim families have been the target of arson attacks. The copies of the Holy Quran have been torn and burned. Muslim dwellings have been vandalized in different ways. The streets of metro metropoles have been the stage for insulting and even physically assaulting Muslim women wearing headscarf. In this regard, one should notice that Muslim women constitute the majority of the victims as a vulnerable group that face multiple discrimination. Hate crime encourages in our globalized world others. The extremists of opposite sides feed and foster each other or rather provide existence for each other. According to an independent monitoring group in an OSCE participating state, the number of reported anti-Muslim hate, crime, hate crimes increased by almost 600% in the week after the mass killings into Christchurch mosques. Now, it is not difficult at all to observe that discriminative discourse that emerged in the public sphere in 1980s and 1990s and, and acquired a momentum after 9-11-2001 against Muslims shows itself in many fields of life. It repeats its hate language in politics, press, social media, education, and administration in many different forms and levels. One can also notice that even certain legislative initiatives tend to restrict the fundamental democratic rights and freedom of religion or belief. White supremacism turns its hate rhetoric against Muslims into an anti-Muslim ideology and it eventually paves the way to the emergence of actual violence against Muslims. As a result, violent events shows up more frequently and yet remain mostly underreported. Anti-Muslim hate speech and behavior that has already penetrated many areas of life with its high potentiality of creating more violence is fortunately encouraged, uh, sorry, encountered by law and order. Constitutional system and commitment to fundamental human rights and freedoms on which our democratic institutions have been established. Bearing in mind the giving facts above, therefore I would like to re-emphasize here the two crucial points for this combating discrimination and intolerance against Muslims under the roof of the OSCE and ODIA there, there, that are committed to the implementation of fundamental human rights and freedoms. The first is the secure basis of democratic institutions and constitutional system and law order based on the fundamental human rights and freedoms on which all participating states have strong consensus. The repeated declarations and documents produced by the OSCE participating states in the course of the OSCE's long history and the programs conducted by ODIA are clear proofs of this consensus. Since its very establishment, the OSCE took action with full, full commitment to fundamental human rights. Accordingly, since the beginning of the millennium, it recognizes that the Muslim community across, or across the OSCE region is the victim of discrimination and intolerance. Through different documents like Astana 2010, Basel two, two, uh, 2014, issued by participating states, this is explicitly condemned. It is the commitment of the participating states to fundamental human rights that enable us to label a hate crime against Muslim, Muslims as well as the members of all other religions as a hate crime 
and this commitment itself con constitutes the main barrier in front of the normalization of discrimination or normalization of discriminative, xenophobic and intolerant discourse circulated by all extremist ideologies. And the key terms of anti-Muslim rhetoric, rhetoric that associates Muslims as a monolithic group with being intolerant, non-rational, and incompatible with modern values, etc., can only be pos can only possible be redefined as xenophobic, uh, discrimination, intolerance, negative stereotyping, hate speech, and crime stigmatization, incitement to violence with the commitment to fundamental rights of freedom of religion or beliefs. The second crucial need in combating intolerance and discrimination against Muslims is that they should be properly recognized, addressed, monitored, and recorded by the government institutions and civil society. Without proper monitoring and reporting, Aside from under-recording, many hate crimes might be deemed as non-existent at all. Still, we have cases where the police may address many racist incidents as ordinary crimes. Luckily, we have good practices also worth noting on combating against increasing intolerance and discrimination. In a participating state's police, uh, state policies encouragement of the affected community to monitoring and reporting against possible hate crimes after the notorious Christchurch event and them being well trained against hate crimes uh, offenses should be noted as good practices that we really need to see more frequently or rather as customary attitude against the hate crimes against Muslims. The strong wording of police uh, the strong wording of the police chief is also worth quoting here. Quotation, no one should ever have to suffer hate crime and I would encourage all victims to report to the police. Quotation ends. Another good practice comes this time from an NGO based in another OSC participating state. It recently reported that a total of uh, 1,920 racist incidents took place in the country last year. At least 1,528 racist incidents out of the total number were reported by a third party and the actual victims prefer to stay silent because of thoughts like these things happen or reporting doesn't change anything. That is why the report uh, said the actual number of racist incidents should, could be much higher. It is the data provided by reports that constitute an assertive reason and tangible content for programs for police, prosecutors, judges, civil society, and other international organizations conducted by the OSCE and ODIR to help ensure that participating states can properly recognize, define, and control hate crimes against Muslims. Many thanks for your patience. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, and I also will uh, say that chairperson in office has personal representatives working with uh, Ambassador Patachi dealing with anti-Semitism and discrimination against Christians and members of other religions. So he has uh, quite a lot to deal with. Dear colleagues, uh, we have heard a great deal of information based on a great deal of irrelevant experience. No, I hope to hear from many of you. I hope that you will take this opportunity not only to reflect on what we have heard, but also to share experiences in combating intolerance and discrimination based on religion and belief in your own countries. 
And I will also like to remind you of what Mr. Belkebir said, with a willingness to enter into dialogue in order to learn. None of our populations are immune to intolerance and discrimination, but forums such as this can help us to find effective ways to combat these threats and to promote gender respect and inclusion. I have 25 speakers on my list, and we have limited time, so I will ask you to please keep your remarks on three minutes so that we can hear from everybody. The first, I would like to address Mr. Mohamed El Milai from Morocco, and the next speaker is Mr. Mukashev Tulubek from Kazakhstan. Mr. Mohamed El Milali, Morocco, the floor is yours. Shukran, Sida Raisa Muhtarama. Hadrat Sayyidat, Ussad Al Afadil, Ada Al Jumri Al Barlamania, Al Maghrib, Al Mundamat Al Amnu Al Ta'awan, Fi Europa. مرحبا بكم في حضيرة المملكة المغربية ونتمنى لكم مقاما طيبا سعيدا بين ظهراننا أود أن أطلع الجمعية البرلمانية لمنظمة الأمن والتعاون في أوروبا على المبادرة التي قام بها برلمان المملكة المغربية ممثلا برئيس مجلس النواب الأستاذ الحبيب الملكي بصفته الرئيس الدوري لمنظمة اتحاد مجلس الدول الأعضاء في منظمة التعاون الإسلامي والمتمثلة في السعي من جانب البرلمانات الإسلامية إلى إقرار يوم عالمي سنوي لمناهضة الإسلاموفية ومن أجل التسامح والحوار الحضاري وهي المبادرة التي أقرتها اللجنة التنفيذية للاتحاد بالإجماع في الدورة الاستثنائية المنعقدة بالرباط بتاريخ 17 يوليو. 2019 وقد اقترحت هذه المبادرة الدولية من أجل تفعيلها على مستوى منظمة الأمم المتحدة ووكالاتها المتخصصة ولا سيما اليونسكو وآليات الأمم المتحدة لحوار وتحالف الحضارات وتروم هذه المبادرة العمل من داخل هيئة الأمم المتحدة من أجل اعتماد يوم عالمي لمناهضة الإسلاموفية من أجل حوار الحضارات والتسامح يكون مناسبة دولية لدعوة إلى التسامح والتعايش والتعريف باعتدال الدين الإسلامي ورفض الخطابات التي تلتصق بالإسلام والمسلمين والتي تتخذ من إيديولوجية الترهيب والتخوين من الإسلام عقيدة لها ومن هذا المنبر منبر الجمعية البرلمانية لمنظمة الأمن والتعاون في أوروبا نطلع إلى دعم هذه المبادرة ونعتمد على جهود برلمانات الدول المخرطة في المنظمة ومهنية برلمانيها وبرلمانيتها لدعم هذه المبادرة والعمل على إسراع بتفعيلها على مستوى هيئة الأمم المتحدة ولا شك أن نبل هذا الرهان يقتضي منا التعبئة والتوجه إلى الضمير العالمي من ساسة ومفكرين وصناع الرأي العام من أجل تحقيق هذا الهدف وفي هذا الإطار قام جلالة الملك محمد السادس نصر الله وأيده بتنظيم الحقل الديني بتكوين هذه الشريحة والعمل على سقل مواهبها بإنشاء أكثر من 14 جامعة يدرس فيها هذا العمل وكذلك مراكز للتكوين بالمملكة المغربية وهذا يعتبر من أنبل الأعمال التي ما فتئ يقوم بها للقضاء على التطرف وإعطاء صورة ناصعة والانخراط مع كل الشركاء وفي مقدمة الفاتيكان التي التي قام البابا بزياره للمملكه المغربيه بتاريخ 30 مارس والتي اختتمت باعلان الرباط بين المملكه المغربيه والفاتيكان ومن هذا المنظور لا يسعنا اليوم الا ان نكون شركاء في هذا العمل التي يقتضي منا العمل ك 
منظمة من أجل تكريس العمل الأخلاقي والسلوكي التي يمكن أن يروم كل المواقع الحضارية بين بلدان العالم وفي الختام كلمة هذه أغتنم هذه المناسبة لأثمن المقترح الرامي إلى اعتماد اللغة العربية ضمن لغات العمل بالجمعة بالجمعية البرلمانية لمنظمة الأمن والتعاون في أوروبا آملا أن يتم إدراج هذا المقترح ضمن توصيات الدورة الثامنة عشر في أفق تفعيله شكرا Thank you, Mr. Milali. Now I give the floor to Mr. Mukashev Tulubek from Kazakhstan, and the ne next speaker is Kanyabek Imaliev from Kyrgyzstan. The floor is yours, Mr. Tulubek. Dear Parliament Assembly, ladies and господа, first of all, I would like to congratulate our Moroccan colleagues. За теплый прием и отметить, что проведение осенней сессии парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ в историческом городе Маракеш является поистине уникальным, так как проходит вне региона ОБСЕ. Мы приветствуем, что в рамках осеннего заседания парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ отдельная сессия посвящена теме борьбы с нетерпимостью и дискриминацией на основе религии и убеждений. На фоне сложной международной обстановки, кризиса нравственных ценностей, обострения межэтнических, межрелигиозных и внутрирелигиозных конфликтов эта тема является как никогда актуальной. В эпоху цифровизации взаимопроникающие связи все чаще устанавливаются людьми разных стран посредством прямого общения через интернет и социальные сети. Этим зачастую пользуются деструктивные и радикальные силы, которые легко затягивают свое лоно людей с неустоявшимся мировоззрением, молодежь, детей, а также людей в трудном экономическом положении. Такие процессы не зависят от воли правительств и общественности, тем не менее нам приходится справляться с их последствиями. Поэтому системная превентивная работа по недопущению причины терпимости выходит в число приоритетных направлений деятельности государств. Принципиально важно сконцентрировать все усилия на вопросах безопасности и образования. Большинство участников радикальных групп представляет собой идейно обманутых людей. Необходимо проводить с ними разъяснительную работу по переубеждению, так как никто из людей не рождается с вирусами радикализма и нетерпимости. Казахстан сформировал свой уникальный опыт продвижения толерантности – Нашу страну населяют представители свыше 100 различных этносов и 18 конфессий. Поэтому казахстанский народ живет по принципу единства многообразия, вбирая в себе лучшие традиции каждого из них, создавая огромную синергию, направленную на созидание. Вам, наверное, известно об инициативе первого президента Казахстана Нурсултана Назарбаева по сосыву съезда лидеров мировых и традиционных религий, которая получила широкое международное признание и стала важным элементом глобального межцивилизационного диалога. Сам факт возможности открытого межконфессионального диалога на самом высоком уровне в непростое время на заре нового тысячелетия казался революционным. С тех пор дальневидная и стратегическая выверенная инициатива первого президента Казахстана не утратила своей актуальности. Еще в первой своей декларации участники съезда заявили о готовности приложить все усилия для того, чтобы не допустить использования религиозных различий в качестве инструмента ненависти и раздора и уберечь человечество от глобального конфликта религии и культур, а также продвижение таких ценностей, как толерантность, истина, справедливость и любовь в качестве основной цели любой проповеди. Казахстан сохранит преемственность намеченного курса. Президент Республики Казахстан Касымжо Мартакаев, который многие годы руководил секретариатом съезда, неоднократно заявлял, что прочный мир и национальное единство в девятой по территории стране мира является важнейшим фактором обеспечения международной стабильности и безопасности. Уважаемые коллеги, в настоящее время мы являемся свидетелями того, 
что обстановка на пространстве ОБСЕ характеризуется утратой взаимного доверия, эскалацией напряженности и серьезными разногласиями, в том числе на почве нетерпимости по религиозным и национальным признакам. В этих условиях существенно возрастает ответственность религиозных лидеров и политиков. Духовные наставники, являясь хранителями моральных и нравственных ценностей, оказывают влияние на умы и настроения людей. В свою очередь политики могут не только притворять жизнь мечты и чаяния народов жить в мире, но и непосредственно реализовывать те высокие идеи, которые озвучиваются религиозными лидерами. Мы считаем, что мировое сообщество, в том числе страны, участницы ОБСЕ и ее партнеры по сотрудничеству, несмотря на существующие разногласия, как никогда должны быть сплоченными для выработки комплексного подхода для предотвращения подобных проблем. Выступая перед участниками четвертого совещания conclude? спикеров парламентов стран Евразии, первый президент Казахстана Нурсултан Назарбаев озвучил ряд предложений по укреплению евразийского диалога, доверия и партнерства между странами континента, призвал сплотить ряды внутри, э, внутри межпарламентского сообщества и повысить эффективность совместной работы на законодательном треке. В частности, особо отметил важность разработки общего определения терроризма, формирования единого списка террористических и экстремистских организаций, международных преступных группировок. Надеюсь, что выработанные нами предложения и инициативы послужат дальнейшему укреплению доверия и взаимопонимания. Только через конструктивный диалог и эффективное взаимодействие мы сможем совместными усилиями обеспечить комплексную безопасность на пространстве ОБСЕ. В заключение хочу пожелать всем благополучного завершения сессии и дальнейших успехов. Благодарю за внимание. Uh, keep within the minutes. The next speaker is Kanyabek Imaliev from Kyrgyzstan and Ms. Inka Hopsu from Finland can, uh, is the next speaker. Mr. Imaliev, the floor is yours. Спасибо, уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемые дамы и господа. Прежде всего, позвольте выразить слова благодарности нашим марокканским друзьям за прекрасное организацию заседания и традиционно теплое гостеприимство. Возвращаясь к теме нашей сессии, хочу поделиться опытом Кыргызстана в борьбе с нетерпимостью на основе религии и убеждений. Конституция Кыргызской Республики, принятая общенациональным референдумом в 2010 году, закладывает основу для развития антидискриминационного законодательства. Основной закон Кыргызской Республики устанавливает государственных Государственные гарантии равенства и прав свобод человека и гражданина, независимо от пола, расы, языка, этнической принадлежности, политических или религиозных убеждений, образования, происхождения, имущественного или иного положения. Сегодня борьба с нетерпимостью и дискриминацией до сих пор остается актуальным вопросом для всего мира. Для искоренения этих вопросов необходимы усилия не только государства, но и общественности в целом. В Кыргызской республике она твердо закреплена на уровне общей государственной политики и основывается на принципах равенства. Хочу отметить, что республика также приняла на себя ряд международных обязательств в рамках ООН, ликвидации этой конвенции ООН о ликвидации всех форм нетерпимости и дискриминации. В настоящее время страна идет активно работа по выполнению рекомендаций заключительных замечаний Комитета ООН по вопросам дискриминации. Кыргызская республика, являясь активным участником многих международных организаций по правам человека, последовательно оставляет политикой гармонизации межэтнических отношений, межрелигиозных отношений и усилий по долгосрочной интеграции этнических сообществ Кыргызской республики. Наша страна является политическим государством, где проживают представители свыше 100 различных этносов, различных религиозных конвенций. За последний год республика достигнет заметный прогресс в развитии межрелигиозного многообразия, культурного многообразия, создания условий для удовлетворения этнокультурных потребностей людей разных этнических сообществ и религиозных конвенций. При государственном агентстве и местном самоуправлении межэтнические отношения при правительстве Кыргызской Республики действует мониторинговый центр по вопросам мониторинга, анализа рисков социальных и религиозных конфликтов, в том числе области профилактики насильственного экстремизма. В данное время стороны разрабатывается концепция по гражданской интеграции. Основными приоритетами данного стратегически важного документа является 
дальнейшее формирование общей гражданской идентичности, совершенствование системы равного, равного предупреждения и предотвращения межэтнических, межрелигиозных конфликтов, формирование многоязычного поколения, обеспечение равного участия этнических групп в общественной политической жизни страны, управление многообразием. Целью концепции является создание условий для формирования общей гражданской идентичности и толерантности под названием «Кыргыз Жараны» – «Кыргызский гражданин», достижение баланса между общей гражданским единством граждан страны и ее социокультурным религиозным многообразием. Кроме того, уже 25 лет Кыргызская республика формируется уникальный институт – это Ассамблея народов Кыргызстана, консультативный совещательный орган, по взаимодействию с госорганами, этнокультурными центрами и религиозными конвенциями в вопросах укрепления единства народа страны, призванные способствовать основным принципам справедливого миростроительства на основе общей гражданской идентичности. Ассамблея народов Кыргызстана работает в тесном контакте с духовным управлением нашей страны. Она создавалась только с одной целью, что все сограждане страны, Ясно и четко осознавали, что кыргызская земля, несмотря на национальность и вероисповедание, также является их общей родиной. Данная организация с самого начала наш, решили назвать Ассамблеей народов Кыргызстана, что недвусмысленно указывало на желание всех этносов и представителей различных религиозных конвенций стать единой сплоченной нацией. Уважаемые коллеги, надеюсь, озвученный мной опыт... Я заканчиваю. В завершение хотел бы поблагодарить за предоставленную возможность и пожелать всем успехов в вопросах укрепления и развития международных норм в области прав человека. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you, Madam Chair. According to stati statistics, 80% of population today belong to a religious community. Combating religious intolerance and discrimination has been one of the top priorities of the international human rights system for decades in Un United Nations as well as in, uh, the OSCE. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights offers equal and universal human rights to all, men and women, believers and non-believers. It has been and still is a great source of inspiration to combat discrimination and mar marginalization everywhere. Prin principle 7 of the OSCE Final Act document affirms the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms including the freedom of thought, conscience, religious, or belief. But still, we see today around the world increasing discrimination, intolerance, and xenophobia against believers of different religions. And this is unfortunately the case also in Europe and the OSCE countries. It is hardly possible to combat intolerance and discrimination without looking into the root causes of the phenomena and the circumstances that provoke people to engage in hate speech and discrediting behavior. The United Nations has adopted a strategy and plan of action which has two main objectives. It aims to address the root causes of hate speech, such as violence, marginalization, discrimination, poverty, exclusion, inequality, lack of basic education and weak state institutions. Secondly, the plan of action includes recommendations of actions and measures to counter phenomena. Actions are needed at many levels and also here in OSCE. Governments and political leaders need to express clearly that they condemn any advocacy of religious hatred against individuals that constitute incitement to discrimination, hostility or violence. The issue has to be addressed in open public debates as well as as part of interfaith and intercultural dialogue at local, national and international levels. Interreligious and interfaith dialogues should include all. Religious leaders should give positive example 
and especially important is to give safe place for young people to discuss similarities and differences between each other's faiths, to understand and accept different religions, and to inspire them to make their communities more religiously tolerant. Such debates will also play a positive role in strengthening democracy and the principles of rule of law. It is important to include and convene individuals and groups with opposing views and work with traditional and social media platforms, engaging in advocacy and developing guidance for communications to counter hate speech, trends and campaigns. While digital technology has provided new areas in which hate speech can thrive, it can also help to monitor activity, target our response and build support for counter-narratives. Finally, building social cohesion and supporting the peaceful coexistence in diverse, multi-religious societies needs responsible action from all, not least from us as parliamentarians. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hopse. And now the floor is given to Mr. Francois Yulivet from France, and the next speaker is Mr. Vadim Halaychuk from Ukraine. Mr. Yulivet, the floor is yours. Merci, Madame la Présidente, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, mes chers collègues. Lutter contre l'intolérance et les discriminations est le nécessaire combat de ce siècle peut-être le plus important pour l'avenir de notre communauté humaine, pour la paix. Il appartient à la communauté internationale, donc à nous toutes et tous, de défendre l'intégrité de l'individu dans ce qu'il a de plus profond, sa liberté de conscience qui lui permet de vivre sa vie d'homme. Cette liberté de conscience est universelle, intangible et indivisible. Cette liberté de conscience lui permet de pratiquer sa religion ou de ne pas pratiquer, de croire ou de ne pas croire, et cela dans le respect de l'autre. Cette liberté de conscience lui permet de choisir sa religion, quel que soit son lieu de vie. L'approche retenue actuellement à l'OSCE est de discuter séparément de ces sujets. Nous avons trois représentants spéciaux de la présidence à caractère thématique, présente un risque, celui de sélectionner certaines causes de discrimination et d'en ignorer d'autres, les discriminations sur base d'opinion, les discriminations concernant l'orientation sexuelle ou celles dont sont victimes les femmes dans l'espace OSCE. L'approche qui est la nôtre, ce que je regrette, comporte le risque de reconnaître des droits en fonction de l'orientation religieuse ou de pensée. Ce n'est pas conforme au principe de l'universalité des droits de l'homme, dont le principe fondateur est le respect de la personne humaine et de sa liberté de conscience. Pour lever ce risque, qui selon moi constitue une menace, il nous appartient dans un même élan de porter en étendard le seul genre humain. Le principe même de l'universalité nous invite à cela. Répondre aux défis de l'intolérance et des discriminations est notre enjeu collectif. Nous ne pourrons y répondre que si et seulement si nous défendons la protection universelle des libertés et des droits fondamentaux. Le mode opératoire choisi par notre Assemblée risque de rendre légitime la création de droits asymétriques entre les individus. On ne peut l'accepter. Comme vous, je n'oublie pas que l'homme n'est que le passager d'un temps qui passe et que nul n'est né pour subir. Sa liberté de conscience et sa première liberté, c'est elle seule que nous devons défendre. Je vous remercie. Thank you. And now the floor is given to Mr. Vadim Halaychuk from Ukraine, and the next speaker is Mrs. Daniela Dorido from Germany. Mr. Halaychuk from Ukraine, the floor is yours. Madam Chairperson, distinguished delegates, Ukraine is a multinational country with over 130 peoples of different religious backgrounds. The government of Ukraine has always attached great importance to the promotion of tolerance, mutual respect, and understanding within Ukrainian society. The position of the President of Ukraine and the government of Ukraine remains clear and resolute. Ukraine is not a place for discrimination and intolerance of, on any grounds because respect, mutual respect for life and dignity of every person is the highest value in Ukrainian society. Domestic religion policy is based on principle of facilitation of full-fledged dialogue 
between representatives of various social, ethnic, cultural, and religious groups to force the creation of tolerant society. Uh, Religion Freedom Roundtable in Ukraine was established in a April 2019 to facilitate uh, promotion of these values. Ukraine strongly condemns any forms of intolerant behavior and anti-Semitism. Ukrainian law enforcement bodies react rapidly and adequately to prevent any such behavior. Ukrainian authorities determined to respond resolutely to any manifestation of xenophobia, discrimination, uh, and stop attempts to spread motivated hostilities in the society, which in most cases are brought into Ukraine from outside. For decades, Russian Orthodox Church have aimed at deepening divisions in the Ukrainian society, in particular by dividing the Ukrainian Christians, Orthodox people, into the correct and the incorrect uh, Christians. Uh, canonical and non-canonical. Last year, Orokiafali was granted to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine by the Mother Church Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, which was a very, very wise decision. And this provides for crucial element of stability and is very important for unification in the Orthodox Church. Now, freedom of religion and belief is under severe attack in Ukraine in the territories that were illegally occupied by Russian Federation, namely the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, city of Sevastopol, and certain territories in Donetsk and Luhansk region. Believers in the occupied territories of Ukraine are currently deprived of religious pluralism, participation of religious organizations in public life. Uh, they, they force together underground sometime and don't have the opportunity for joint prayers and holding religious ceremonies. Religious prosecution is also experienced by Muslims. We condemn the baseless prosecution of dozens of peaceful, peaceful Muslims in Crimea for allegedly belonging to Islamic organizations. According to OHCR report on the human rights situation in Ukraine, issued in May 2019, since beginning of the occupation, 59 individuals have been arrested or convicted on accusations of affiliation with banned Muslim groups in Crimea, vast majority of whom are Crimean Tatars. Twelve of them have been found guilty and received criminal sentences. They all were prosecuted under Russian Federation law. We urge Russia to put an end to repressive policies in its occupation administration in Crimea and parts of Donbass and abide by the international commitments regarding the freedom of religion and belief. More than once here in this hall, we heard calls for more action and less, less words. Uh, in Ukraine, we are committed to international treaties that regulate issues of religious freedom and we ask for more actions in respect to those violations that we have just indicated in our report. Thank you all. Thank you. And now I give the floor to Mrs. Daniela de Rida from Germany, and Mrs. Ulyava Agehiava from Azerbaijan is uh, the next speaker. Mr. Daniela de Rida, the floor is yours. Vielen Dank, Frau Vorsitzende, und mein Dank geht vor allem an die Organisationen auf marokkanischer Seite für dieses, diese hervorragende Möglichkeit, über ein Thema zu sprechen, das uns allen sehr am Herzen liegen muss, nämlich auch die Frage der religiösen Diskriminierung. In Deutschland ist Religionsfreiheit in der Verfassung verankert, und das ist, glaube ich, auch eine sehr gute Sache. Ich will gar keinen Hehl daraus machen, dass die maghrebinischen Länder für uns Vorbildfunktion für die arabische Welt haben können, gerade weil sie eben auch sehr fortschrittlich denken. Wir haben ein Abkommen in Bezug auf die Flüchtlinge getroffen mit Marokko und das konnten wir gestern diskutieren. Und auch das Erbrecht in Tunesien, das die Frauenrechte stärkt, ist etwas Beispielgebendes. Umso mehr sind Berichte beunruhigend, die uns aktuell erreichen. Und ich möchte Sie deshalb noch mal ganz besonders auf den Gender-Aspekt hinweisen. 
Die Berichte lauten um die äh, Journalistin Haja Raisuni, dass es hier irgendwie junge Frauen gibt, die insbesondere Opfer von mesogyner Rechtsprechung geworden sind. Raisuni ist eine Journalistin, die möglicherweise des Islamismus verdächtig ist, weil sie einen Onkel hat, der eher nicht regierungsaffin aufzutreten scheint. Und sie ist verurteilt worden für ein Jahr Haft, äh, geschlossene Haft, äh, aufgrund außerehelichen Geschlechtsverkehrs. Das sind Dinge, die uns eher äh, erschüttern. Und umso mehr ist es wichtig, dass wir Genderfragen auch hier in Marokko ansprechen. Illegaler Schwangerschaftsabbruch wird ihr vorgeworfen und das, obwohl sie selbst sagt, ähm, sie habe eine Blutung erfahren innerhalb der Schwangerschaft selbst. Herr Belkebier, ich glaube, dass es wichtig ist, dass wir hier erkennen, dass wir gemeinsame Ziele haben. Ja, wir sollten den Wahhabismus bekämpfen, weil das hier zu Extremismus führt. Und andererseits, Herr Belkebier, andererseits, Herr Belkebier, Herr Belkebier, dazu führt, Herr Belkebier, je vous adresse, Monsieur Belkebier, parce que je crois que c'est une cause très importante de parler, weil es mir sehr wichtig ist, gerade auch Marokko hier zu adressieren und noch mal deutlich zu machen, Herr Belkebier, dass wir ein gemeinsames Ziel haben, wenn wir die Ausgrenzung von Frauen, insbesondere auch jungen Frauen, äh, weiter so betreiben, wie das der Fall zu sein scheint. Die Verfolgung von Frauen wird in unseren europäischen Ländern aufgrund des, der Islamophobie dazu benutzt, sich auszubauen, sich zu entfalten. Deshalb sollte es unser gemeinsames Anliegen sein, auch die Frauenrechte im Islam stärker zu schützen und zu achten. Soziale Sicherheit innerhalb der OSZE, ein sehr zentrales Ziel, wird nicht gelingen, wenn wir nicht auch die Menschenrechte von Frauen akzeptieren, denn Frauenrechte sind immer auch Menschenrechte. Dem Programm, das Sie vorgestellt haben, Herr Belkebier, möchte ich neben Bildung und Aufklärung vor allem die Rechtsprechung anfügen, die Beschäftigung und die Armutsbekämpfung. Und bitte vergessen Sie nicht, dass auch der Unterschied zwischen Großstädten und ländlichen Räumen eine sehr zentrale Rolle spielt, damit Wertehaltung und Antikorruption sich nicht durchsetzen können. Can you please conclude? Der Extremismus muss ein gemeinsames Ziel sein und bleiben in der OSZE und er darf die Frauenrechte nicht aussparen. Shukran, danke schön. Thank you. Now the floor goes to Mrs. Agayeva from Azerbaijan, and the next speaker is Mr. Nikolai Ryushak from Russia. Mrs. Agayeva, the floor is yours. And you. I just have to say that I close the speaker's list now. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to start by thanking our distinguished hosts for their hospitality and excellent organization of the meeting. Of course, intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief threaten the security of individuals, and this in turn may cause even large-scale confl conflict and violence that undermine international security and stability. As most of you are aware that Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani people celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Azerbaijan Democratic Republic last year, the establishment of Azerbaijan Democratic Republic was a historic event. Despite the fact that the Azerbaijan Democratic Republic lasted for 23 months, it managed to do a great deal of, a great deal of work in a short period of time. Creating favorable conditions for the representation of national minorities and ethnic groups in a democratic parliament was one of the significant achievements of the newly formed ADR. Moreover, we are very proud to say that the gender equality and the approach that we used to have dates back even to the origins of Azerbaijan's democratic past. One of the most important accomplishments of our parliament was the extension of suffrage to women, making Azerbaijan the first Muslim nation to grant women equal political rights with men preceding most of the Western countries in the position. 
to grant all its citizens equal rights, regardless of their ethnic, religious, social background, was something very important that happened in the entire Muslim and Turkic world. Now we are very proud to say that when we regained our independence in 1991, we firmly set our track towards the gender equality. In 1995, Azerbaijan ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. The State Committee on Women's Affairs was established by presidential decree on the 14th of January 1998. In 2000, the national leader Haidar Aliyev signed the decree on implementation of the national gender policy in the Republic of Azerbaijan. This act envisaged the ensuring of equal representation of women and men in all state structures of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Ever since, our gender policies have evolved. Today, after 101 years, Azerbaijani women are active participants in the development and progress of the country. Let me stress that the new and young generation of Azerbaijani women leaders are very much encouraged by the example of the First Lady of Azerbaijan, Mehriban Aliyeva. To sum up, let me add that equal rights and participation for women are essential contributors to stability and security for all. And this, in turn, reflects the principles of the inclusive society where all people feel valued and regardless of their socioeconomic status, they have the right to access and influence decision-making processes. I want to note as well that ensuring equal rights, freedom of religion or belief, and tolerance and non-discrimination for all people is vital to security and peace in the OC area. Thank you for attention. Thank you. Just on time. Now I will give the floor to Mr. Richak from Russia. The floor is yours. Уважаемый председатель, уважаемые коллеги. Мы хотели бы обратить ваше внимание, что Хельсинский заключительный акт содержит очень интересный раздел, который призывает страны ОБСЕ наладить взаимодействие с государствами среди морского региона. И государство Марокко в полной мере поддержали эту высокую марку, обеспечили нам конструктивную работу и хорошую культурную программу. Благодарим вас за это. Вы, наверное, обратили внимание, что российская делегация максимально сдержанно вела себя на этой площадке, не отвечала на резкие выпады и была привержена конструктивному диалогу. Мы поощряли каждое выступление, внимательно относились к нему. И вот мы заслушали выступление депутата от Украины Галычука. В то время, когда наши коллеги, бережно относились к дискуссии, обходили острые углы. Почему? Потому что хрупкий мир наконец-то задышал видимой какой-то свободой, что нам удастся преодолеть вот последствия этого кризиса на Украине, где два субъекта – это власти Украины и две непризнанные республики, которые отказались принять государственный перевод и защитили свой родной язык. И в это время, когда идет поиск формулы Штайнмайера, которая содержит многие пункты Минского соглашения, когда замаячила перспектива нормандского заседания, вот в это время звучат вот такие, я бы сказал, провокационные, безответственные выступления представителя партии Зеленского «Слуга народа». Как вы думаете, какую услугу оказывает этот депутат в своем выступлении вот нормализации общей ситуации и поиску компромисса? Второе, что мы хотели бы сказать – на фоне тревожной тенденции нарастания на пространствах ОБСЕ, агрессии, нетерпимости, дискриминации на религиозной этнической почве, мы планируем поднять эти темы на СМИД ОБСЕ в Братиславе 5-6 декабря. Надеемся на вашу поддержку. Это тем более важно и то, что это происходит на кануне праздновать 75-й годовщины победы Великой Отечественной войны. Мы хотели обратить ваше внимание, что нужна поддержка нашей резолюции, осуждающей неонацизм. Напомним, что 73-я сессия Генеральной Ассамблеи ОБСЕ уже который раз поддержала и приняла резолюцию, которая осуждает правос... превосходство каких-либо нацистских теорий осуждает неонацизм. 
И я скажу, что если он способен это делать, мы очень сожалеем, что на площадках ОБСЕ мы пока еще не поднялись до этого уровня. Будем надеяться, что теории, которые мы сегодня обсуждаем, они, к сожалению, очень близки еще к одной вечной человеческой проблеме, проблеме и врага цивилизации. Это террор, террор. К сожалению, в ряде стран террор и фашизм – это родные братья, которые кое-где становятся основой государственной идеологии и политической практики. Мы считаем, что мы должны дружно выработать меру, дать соответствующую оценку и по нашей российской юрисдикции ИГИЛ уже приравнивается к организации фашистского характера. И там, где мы даем покровительство, пытаемся поддержать эту агрессивную, реакционную организацию, мы делаем медвежью услугу. Человечество должно, должно выступить единым фронтом. И еще раз в заключение хотел бы сказать, что мы выступаем за изменение yeah, правил процедур conclude, и надеемся, Chuck. что в Ванкувере мы будем работать по новому регламенту. Наш представитель вчера на постоянном комитете подробно изложил позицию российской делегации. Благодарю за внимание. Good examples from my uh, country. Uh, the Constitution of the Republic of Serbia protects the right to freedom of religion. In Serbia, 33 churches and religious communities are registered in the official register regulated by the law. The majority population is Orthodox, 85% of total population. 5% identifies Catholic. 3% identifies Muslim and 1% identifies Protestants. Serbia is a multicultural state and its population includes members of 25 officially registered national minorities with different religious beliefs. They have the right to be educated in their own language and to manifest their religi religious beliefs freely. I'm proud as a member of the majority Orthodox population that a state we have been able to nurture all the particularities of the other nations. Diversity is an advantage, not a disadvantage, but prejudice are the result of ignorance which generates a reasonable, reasonable sphere. We cannot speak of prejudice against a member of only one religion. There, is, there are numerous examples of discrimination against Christians as well. Serbs in some of our neighboring countries are faced with serious violation of human rights. I'm referring to the right to language, script, and religion. We are faced with the usurpation of the property of the Serbian Orthodox Church. The earliest Serbian Orthodox monasteries have been built in the 9th century. We just want those countries to apply the same principles as we apply in our own country in respect of their nations. International organizations should be paying more attention on that issue. And finally, we must nurture diversity because multiculturalism is the greatest civilization value. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now the floor goes to Ms. Moslet from Norway, and the next speaker is uh, Mr. Romanescu from Romania. Ms. Moslet, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. The freedom to believe or not to believe is an individual right. This freedom is an important aspect of the Helsinki Final Act, which we base our work upon. I would like to pinpoint our rule the role of parliaments in combating intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief and use my own parliament as an example. The Norwegian Equality and Anti-Discrimination Act was amended 
and consolidated on the 1st of January 2018. The Act prohibits all form of discrimination based on uh, religion and beliefs. It is and had, has been an integral and important part of Norwegian law. Nevertheless, the Norwegian Parliament in April last year, four months later, decided um, with no votes against to task the government to prepare a national action plan against racism and ethnic and religious discrimination. We are now also debating an um, additional action plan against Islamophobia. These examples how we can never be content with the status quo on this issue, even though the status quo may be good one. And we, as parliamentarians, have a special responsibility to follow up. Thank you. And now the floor goes to Mr. Roman Scanu from Romania, Romania, and the next speaker is Mr. Babic from Croatia. Mr. Roman Scanu from Romania, the floor is yours. <laughs> it's complicated, yeah. Thank you very much, dear Mr. President. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin by expressing on behalf of the Romanian delegation our thanks to our hosts for the outstanding welcome and excellent organization of the autumn meeting of our assembly in the beautiful and inspiring city of Marrakesh. Dear colleagues, with your permission, I will share you a few remarks on the human rights dimension of our theme. We are deeply concerned about the upsurge in intolerance and discrimination in the OAC area, as well as about the acts of violence committed for these reasons. All these movements of hate, be they racist, anti-Semitic, anti-Christians and anti-Muslims or anti-Roma, are contrary to all values of human rights and are a source of conflict. This is not a moral obligation, but OSCE commitments. Dear colleagues, given the European context marked by the worrying increase of intolerance during the presidency of the European Union Council recently held by Romania, combating of intolerance was at the top of its agenda. The priorities of the Romanian EU Council Presidency within the fourth pillar dedicated to the Europe of common values included themes like combating of racism, intolerance, xenophobia, populism, anti-Semitism and hate speech. Against this background, the Romanian European Union Council Presidency hosted an event dedicated to promoting Holocaust remembrance and combating Holocaust denials through memorial museums. The main objective of this event was to facilitate an, an exchange of views on the future of Museum of Jewish History and of the Holocaust in Romania, one of the most important ongoing initiatives in Romania on Holocaust remembrance and education. The role of formal and non-formal education is constantly underlined when it comes to efficiency combat all of of all forms of intolerance and discriminatory discourse and behaviors. Dear colleagues, we consider it extremely important to adopt a comprehensive human rights-based approach in the fight against any form of intolerance and discrimination to protect every individual regardless of their background and to turn our own society into a place where living together makes sense. Religious affiliation is, for many citizens, an intrinsic element of their identities, and this affiliation is expressed through worship and respect of religious practices. The right to follow its own religious precept cannot restrict the rights of others to exert their own convictions or beliefs. This is in fact the quintessence of living together, our endeavor to strike a balance between conflicting interests resulting from the exercise of freedom of thought, conscience and religion. Dear colleagues, events organized by the recognized religious denominations in Romania, including the Jews and Muslim communities, are well attended by Romanian senior state officials. On these occasions, they express the support for an active role of religious denominations in our society and for the respect of religious freedom and the rights of persons belonging to national and religious minorities in our country. Thank you very much for your kind attention. 
Thank you very much. Now the floor goes to Mr. Babic from Croatia, and the next speaker is Mrs. Samsonian from Armenia. Mr. Babic from Croatia, the floor is yours. Can you please turn off the microphone in Romania? Excuse me, Romania, can you please turn out your microphone? Thank you. Mr. Babic, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we in Croatia testify to the good relations in the government with the Islamic community in Croatia, headed by Mufti Aziz Efendia Hasanovic, which is a man of dialogue. This year, in January 15, we opening an international conference on Muslim communities in Europe and the duties and responsibilities. The Mufti Aziz Hasanovic said that the local community of the Muslim faithful had been showing for years that it could serve as a model for addressing the Muslim in Europe, as well as for solving the status of Christian minorities in the Islamic world. The Croatia is one of the few countries in Europe and beyond the recognized Islam and the official religion a hundred years ago. And in doing so, it has guaranteed all human and religious right to Muslims in Croatia, which Croatian society can be particularly proud of because we are among the first in Europe to do so. We have a constructive dialogue with all churches and religious communities in Croatia and the position of faith between members of different religious communities to further develop understanding and interreligious cooperation. The model of regulation of relations between the government and the Islamic community in Croatia is an example to all. He exemplifies that through open dialogue, mutual respect and even listening, a common conscience can be reached in the respect to freedom of conscience and religion, a fundamental human right for all Croatians. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now the floor goes to Mr. Babic from Croatia, and the next speaker is Mrs. Samsonian from Armenia. Excuse me, Romania. Can you please turn off your microphone? Thank you. Excuse me, Romania. Can you please turn out your microphone? Thank you. Excuse me, Romania. Can you please turn out your microphone? Thank you. Excuse me, Romania. Can you please turn out your microphone? Thank you. Excuse me, Romania. Can you please turn out your microphone? Thank you. Excuse me, Romania. Can you please turn out your microphone? Thank you. Excuse me, Romania. Can you please turn out your microphone? Thank you. Excuse me, Romania. Can you please turn out your microphone? Thank you. Excuse me, Romania. Can you please turn out your microphone? Thank you. Excuse me, Romania. Can you please turn out your microphone? Thank you. Excuse me, Romania. Can you please turn out your microphone? Thank you. When many Muslims in Croatia become involved in the defense of their homeland, and many of them he pointed out, they lay down, they live for their freedom. And it is especially well known that every year, especially on the second day on the Ramadan Bayram, the Islamic center commemorates their sacrifice and the contribution of the freedom and independence of our Croatia. This example of coexistence in the Republic of Croatia can serve to many countries. And as Mufti Hasanovic said, it is easy to be a Muslim in Croatia. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. The floor is now given to Mrs. Samsonian from Armenia. And Mrs. Konienko from Russia is the next speaker. Ms. Samsonian from Armenia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Religious intolerance and its rhetoric, the first, intensifies hatred, the second takes leaves, and the third leads to cultural vandalism. As proof of these three beliefs I have set out, I will bring three relevant cases. First, when we say that religious intolerance intensifies hatred, we mean the situation when in Turkey, a high-ranking official publicly made a statement about Gavurs, or prominent Turkish media outlet published a column headlined, No Friend of Such a Gavur. According to Turkish language association, Gavur means a non-believer person. 104 years ago, 1 million, 1.5 million Christian Armenians were killed by the Turks of the Ottoman Empire under the influence of the dangerous word and rhetoric. In this regard, I must appreciate the approach which we fixed in the Luxembourg Declaration welcoming the recent recognition of Armenian genocide by the Italian Chamber of Deputies, as well as the designation by France of 24 April as the day for the commemoration of the Armenian genocide as measures which promote awareness and contribute to the eradication of such atrocities and calling on national parliaments to follow them. 
Second, when we say that religious intolerance takes thousands of lives, we mean the situation. What is happening in the Mediterranean area and region now? Armenia has been the first country in the framework of OSCE to condemn mass atrocities perpetrated by Islamic State and al-Nusra against Yazidis in Iraq and Armenians in Syria. In its 2014 declaration, the Parliamentary Assembly called the OEC participating states to prevent the use of their territories by terrorist and fundamentalist groups for attacks against civilians, religions, and ethnic minorities. The problem continues to remain actual, and member states of OEC should multiply their efforts. Parliamentarians should play an important role in condemning for previous genocides against Christians and other ethnic minorities whose tendency we are experiencing today in Syria and Iraq. As for cultural vandalism, months ago The Guardian, British famous newspaper, published an article headlined Monumental Loss, Azerbaijan and the World's Cultural Genocide of the 21st Century. In article was mentioned that the greatest cultural disaster taking place at the moment not in Syria, but in Caucasus, meaning the destruction of Armenian cross stones in Azerbaijan. Because of religion intolerance, Armenophobia and discrimination, all ethnic Armenians were dispelled from Nahijevan, which is the part of Azerbaijan now. The 10,000 Armenian cross stones were maintained only after them, from Middle Ages which are exceptional cultural heritage for Christians. How strong is the hatred and intolerance that even the graves are destroyed after human? Dear colleagues, I would like to conclude my speech with the following question. Uh, do you imagine what will happen with alive people in Nagorno-Karabakh with their graves, with their heritage, cultural heritage, in such a conditions of intolerance, discrimination, and hatred. Thank you for the attention. Thank you. Now the floor is given to Mr. Konienko from Russia, and the next speaker is Mr. Hadjani from Cyprus. Mr. Konienko from Russia, the floor is yours. Уважаемый председатель, уважаемые коллеги, Власти Российской Федерации уделяют пристальное внимание вопросам противодействия дискриминации по признакам вероисповедания, преследования верующих и религиозных деятелей осквернения мест религиозного культа. Исходим из необходимости комплексного подхода к рассмотрению религиозной проблематики при равном внимании ко всем традиционным мировым религиям. Россия ежегодно вносит на рассмотрение Генеральной Ассамблеи Организации Объединенных Наций проект резолюции «Борьба с героизацией нацизма, неонацизма и другими видами практик, которые способствуют эскалации современных форм расизма, расовой дискриминации, ксенофобии и связанной с ними нетерпимости». Последний раз этот документ был принят 17 декабря прошлого года на пленарном заседании 73-й сессии Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН. С авторами проекта помимо России выступили 54 государства. Его поддержку проголосовало 129 государств, 54 делегации, включая страны ЕС, воздержались, при том, что резолюция носит тематический характер и ориентирована на сотрудничество и диалог. Против выступили лишь США и Украина. Неизменно широкая поддержка российской инициативы подтверждает единство соавторов данной резолюции о том, что всякое выступление в пользу национальной, расовой или религиозной ненависти должно быть запрещено законом о распространении идей подстрекательств к расовой или религиозной дискриминации должны быть объявлены преступлениями, наказуемыми по закону в соответствии с международными правовыми обязательствами государств. К сожалению, аналогичная резолюция не была поддержана нашими коллегами на, парламентской, на заседании парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ в Люксембурге. По какой причине? Да по той, что она была внесена прежде всего со стороны российской делегации. А в этой резолюции мы акцентировали самые острые проблемы, с которыми сталкиваются многие государства Европы. И самое основное, вот в эту проблему втягивают именно молодежь. 
Государствам следует обратить особое внимание на отношение к молодежи. Именно молодежь является, к сожалению, наиболее подверженной негативным идеям насилия, экстремизма, радикализма. Не секрет, что даже в самых развитых странах наибольшее число безработных – молодежь. В связи с этим система образования должна быть направлена на воспитание молодого человека в духе уважения к правам человека и нетерпимости, к проявлениям дискриминации в обществе, должна учить защищать свои права цивилизованными и правовыми способами. А государствам следует уделять особое внимание социальной поддержке молодежи от бесплатного гарантированного образования до поддержки в трудоустройстве, особенно в поиске первой работы и помощи молодым семьям. Таким образом, социальная политика неотделима от задачи обеспечения национальной и международной безопасности и стабильного развития государства. А система образования и система работы с молодежью в целом являются залогом не только экономического и технологического развития государства, но и его социального благополучия, напрямую влияет на уровень обеспечения прав человека. Благодарю за внимание. And after him, Mr. Emmanuel Klever from USA. Mr. Hardiani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today, almost uh, 45 years after the Helsinki Final Act, many OSCE countries uh, have come a long way in combating intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief. At the same time, challenges such as antisemitism Islamophobia and Christianophobia persist. The Helsinki Final Act acknowledges the freedom of religion or belief, and rightly so, since it is a prerequisite for the preservation of peace and stability, as well as a constant for democracy. Our states are stronger when people of all faiths feel that they are welcome that they are full and equal members of our societies. This is why we need to constantly reaffirm this fundamental freedom, the right to practice our faith the way we, cho we choose, to change our faith if we choose, to practice no faith at all if we choose, and to do so free of persecution and fear of discrimination. Combating intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief does not preclude, but actually requires open and transparent dialogue between public authorities and members of different religious or belief communities. We cannot let freedom of religions be misused as a tool in the hands of subversive forces, which, if left unchecked, would threaten the wider social cohesion, security, and other human rights that we value and protect. In this regard, the OSC human dimension of security provides a positive agenda for fighting intolerance and discrimination. Firstly, as leg legislators, we need to make sure that domestic leg legislation reflects OSCE com commitments in this area and international standards in this field. Secondly, interfaith and interreligious dialogue and cooperation can enhance the conditions for peaceful and secure societies in the OSCE region by creating and maintaining trust understanding and cooperation among people of different faiths. We need to encourage activities and promote inclusion through education. Thirdly, we have a role to play in breaking down stereotypes, stereotypes that have been perpetuated through negative media coverage. Fourthly, as a necessary last resort mechanism, OSE participating states should create more available, accessible, and clear response mechanisms to address manifestations of intolerance and discrimination. Last but not least, in the context of our efforts to address conflicts in the OSE region, we cannot remain idle when desecration of religious places 
intimidation of the clergy and obstruction of freedom of religion take place be can you please in the Turkish occupied area of Cyprus. We can be sure that in the absence of respect for the freedom of religion, no breakthrough can be achieved. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. <coughs> we have a limited time, so I will again ask you to uh, keep to your three minutes. The next speaker is Mr. Cleaver from USA, and after him, Mr. Konyorian from Armenia. Mr. Cleaver, the floor is yours. Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely convinced irreversibly that intolerance is the devil's favorite tool. The world has become far too small for intolerance. This legendary American comedian, Bob Hope, uh, had the hiccups as he boarded a plane in New York for London. He later said to a crowd in London, I hicked in New York and cupped uh, in London. The world is now too small for us to be too, so intolerant. And usually this kind of thing begins with words. Intolerance always begins with words. Words can, can elect and words can reject. Words can desecrate and words can elevate. Words can kill and words can heal. In my own country, hate crimes have increased with 8,828 victims compared to last year's report of 7,615 victims according to the most recent Federal Bureau of Investigation Statistics. 60% of the victims were targeted because of the offender's bias against race, ethnicity, or ancestry, while religiously motivated hate crimes also increased by 1,017 Jewish and 325 Muslim victims, making up the majority of religious-based hate crimes. Ladies and gentlemen, we must stop this hate because it is spreading around the world and it can destroy us. I would like to leave you with a word, tolerance. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cleaver. Now the floor goes to Mr. Kondjorian from Armenia, and the next speaker is Mrs. Kutayar from Malta. Dear colleagues, Situation in the Mediterranean region remains alarming and it continues to affect the security of OSCE area. We welcome that the topic of combating intolerance and discrimination based on religion and belief has been included in the agenda of this meeting. First, historically being situated on the crossroads of different civilizations, Armenia has cultivated deeply rooted traditions of coexistence and respect respect towards other cultures and religions. Being the first nation to adopt Christianity as a state religion, Armenia stands among the foundations of the uh, Christian civilization. We always have had very strong relations with Muslim nations and states. As a nation that has communities in around 100 countries of the world, Armenians have first-hand knowledge on the value of tolerance and on the problems of discrimination and hate speech. Second, being historically persecuted in their homeland under foreign domination, including based on the religious grounds. Armenians cannot close eyes to the suffering of those who continue to experience religious discrimination and hate-motivated crimes. We actively contribute to the international efforts aimed at preventing identity-based discrimination and violence. Our most recent initiatives in this regard include the adoption of the Resolution on Genocide Prevention at the UN Human Rights Council in 2015 and the adoption in the same year of the Resolution on International Day of Commemoration of the Victims of Genocide at the UN General Assembly. Countering hate speech, intolerance and xenophobia was one of the main priorities of Armenia during its chairmanship of the Council of Europe in 2013. At the wake of terrorist activities of Daesh and other terrorist groups, Armenia has been among the first in the United Nations and the OSCE to raise the issue of protection of religious and ethnic groups and strongly advocate for the strengthening of the international commitments in this regard. 
Dear colleagues, we deem important for the PA to continue to raise its voice and condemn intolerance and discrimination in all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Mrs. Kutayar from Malta, and the next speaker is Mr. Avicii from Turkey. Mr. Kutayar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Morocco, for the warm hospitality. During a high-level meeting that was hosted by the President of the United States just a few days ago, we heard how 80% of the world's population live in countries where freedom of religion or belief is threatened, restricted, or even banned. We heard United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres say how entire communities are still being targeted because of their faith. All this is still happening in spite of the many efforts to eradicate discrimination and intolerance all over the world. The United Nations Secretary General also stated that the best way to promote freedom of religion or belief is by uniting our voices for good, countering messages of hate with messages of peace, embracing diversity, and protecting human rights everywhere. One way of working towards this is to educate our children, therefore the future generations. We need to invest in our children to help them be the generation that does not discriminate and that is tolerant towards everyone. Children are not born racist. Their nature does not lead them to discriminate against each other. If we use the educational system to nurture their natural sense of equality and inclusion, we might be able to rear a more tolerant generation. Malta, like many more other countries, is committed in protecting human rights, in particular those of members belonging to minority groups and individuals in vulnerable situations. We are currently working on the setting up of a national human rights institution which shall continue to ensure equality and to address discrimination in its many forms. It is our hope that all the work done in individual countries and globally will bear fruit and will see people who are currently being targeted due to their faith or belief living free of any kind of discrimination and intolerance. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now the floor goes to Mr. Avicii from Turkey. And the next speaker is Mrs. Natsiri from Tajikistan. Mr. Avicii. Thank you, Madam Chair. As our American colleague emphasized, hate speech begins with words. And genocide is one of these words to be exploited for political Ends. Genocide is a very narrow legal concept and denotes a clearly defined crime which can only be established by a competent court as defined in the 1948 Genocide Convention. There is neither such verdict with regard to the 1915 events nor any academic or political consensus reached at the international level. As a testament to this fact, the European Court of Human Rights delivered a milestone judgment on 15 October 2015. The decision of the European Court of Human Rights constitutes a strong response against the exploitation and distortion of history and international law for political gains. We regret to see the glorification of terrorist acts as well as the continuous use of hate speech demonizing Turkey and Turks by some politicians and hardliners in the di diaspora, on the Armenian diaspora. We find such rhetoric and acts as irresponsible and dangerous as they keep the threat of Asala-like Armenian terrorism alive. We invite third parties, parliamentarians and their governments, those willing to contribute to acknowledge and support Turkey's, Turkey's constructive efforts, display responsible attitude by standing against initiating, exploiting a historical controversy for political ends.
put pressure of the government of Armenia to engage in dialogue rather than running a systematic war of propaganda, encourage organizations of diaspora Armenians to relinquish their ossified hardline position and offer a more constructive approach instead. Politicization of history neither benefits the academic search for the truth nor helps the ethnic efforts for normalization of relations between our countries. Parliamentary decisions and political statements delivered on the basis of one-sided controversial account of history only serve to the propaganda of ultra-nationalist hardliners and protracts the long beyond reconciliation between our nations. Finally, I totally reject the occupation rhetoric in Cyprus. Nevertheless, we can talk about the violation of interest and inalienable rights of Turkish Cyprus in the island. Merhaba. Thank you. Now the floor goes to Mrs. Nasiri from Tajikistan. And the next, next speaker is uh, Mrs. Uh, El Hamoud from Morocco. Уважаемая госпожа председатель, дамы и господа, реальность сегодня такова, что география нестабильности расширяется. Глобальные угрозы угрожают фундаментальным основам мирового порядка и методам международных отношений. Беспрецедентная волна терроризма и экстремизма в настоящее время превратилась в большую мировую опасность, приносящую общественные, политические и моральные бедствия и катастрофы. Если иметь в виду наш регион, то следует отметить, что действия экстремистских и радикальных групп несут в себе серьезную угрозу в странах Центральной Азии. Они маскируют свои корыстные цели религиозными лозунгами и собирают своих сторонников под знаменем борьбы за справедливую социальную справедливость. Однако на деле они преследуют цель изменить светский строй государства региона и использовать все средства и способы для захвата политической власти. Таджикистан, переживший в своей новейшей истории трагические последствия ужасных проявлений терроризма и экстремизма, хорошо знаком с, подобным, э, потаенным, э, с подобными целями их носителей. Сегодняшняя реальность и императивно диктует необходимость того, чтобы все государства в коллективном формате встали на борьбу против этих разрушительных и э, опасных явлений. Как заявил наш президент, уважаемый ему Мали Рахмон, на пленарном заседании конференции высокого уровня, которая состоялась в городе Душамбе в мае текущего года по теме международное и региональное сотрудничество в борьбе с терроризмом и экстремизмом и источником их финансирования. В этой связи прежде всего должно важно, чтобы все отказались от применения двойных стандартов при определении своего подхода к террористическим и экстремистским организациям и группам. Террористов нельзя делить на своих и чужих, реформаторов и радикалов, добрых и плохих. Ужасающие террористические акты и экстремистские акции последнее время – с очевидностью показали, что террористы и экстремисты не имеют родины, нации, религии и веры. И вызывает э, тревогу и то, что террористические и радикальные группировки для, для распространения экстремистских идей, одурманивая людей и вовлечая их в свои ряды, широко используют информационные технологии, готовят и осуществляют свои разрушительные э, акции с применением дистанционной э, тактики. По действующему законодательству нашей страны от уголовной ответственности освобождаются лица, добровольно отказавшиеся от незаконного участия в вооруженных столкновениях и боевых действиях на территории других государств и вернувшиеся на родину, если их действие не, несет признаков, не имеет признаков состава других преступлений. Одновременно оказывается содействие их реинтеграции в мировую жизнь. В этом контексте за последние годы из-за рубежа 
вернули на родину более 300 своих граждан, которые в целях присоединения к боевикам террористических и экстремистских группировок, особенно так называемого исламского государства, оказались в горячих точках Среднего Востока. В этом числе в конце апреля текущего года усиливая правительство Республики Таджикистан были возвращены 84 детей и подростков, которые со своими родителями выехали в Ирак и остались там без попечителей и опеки. Работа по возвращению на родину других граждан страны, обманутых пропагандой и агитацией Can террористических и радикальных организаций, все еще находящихся в зонах боевых действий, продолжается по сей день. Дорогие друзья, друзья Республика Таджикистан, наряду с активным участием в сотрудничестве стран, ведущих борьбу с терроризмом и экстремизмом, считает важным объединение усилий по устойчивости, безопасности и стабильности в регионе и во всем мире. Благодарю за внимание. Madame la Présidente, chers collègues, la mondialisation a eu comme conséquence directe la standardisation de l'économie, l'uniformisation des habitudes de consommation et le développement d'une culture globale qui transcende les spécificités civilisationnelles des peuples et bafoue leurs repères culturels. Ce nouveau terrain était propice au développement de la criminalité transnationale et au, et, et au commerce illicite des drogues et du trafic d'armes. En arrière-plan de la mondialisation, il y a la redistribution stratégique des rôles entre les grands de ce monde, qui sont entre autres les États, la finance internationale, la, le complexe milita militaro-industriel, ceux qui tiennent les rênes des technologies de l'information et de la communication les faiseurs d'opinion qui sont en mesure d'amener les masses à ne croire que si est bon pour les puissants du monde post-bipolaire dans lequel nous vivons. Un monde sans frontières virtuelles, mais où le mouvement des populations émigrées ou réfugiées provoque le repli identitaire, la montée des nationalismes et la discrimination sur la base de l'ethnie de l'origine et de la confession. Des réflexes primaires, souvent encadrés et orientés pour stigmatiser une culture, une région du monde ou un groupement humain. La montée inquiétante de l'islamophobie est essentiellement la résultante d'un matraquage médiatique global et systématique qui surfe sur la confusion délibérée entre terrorisme et islam entre danger nucléaire et islam, entre discrimination à l'égard des femmes et islam. Toute cette violence était anticipée en l'absence de politique dissuasive ou de, de discours de haine. Les gouvernements démocratiques occidentaux doivent agir pour protéger l'esprit de liberté et le pluralisme au sein de leur société avant qu'il ne soit trop tard. Pourquoi ne pas demander un traité international interdisant la promotion de toutes les formes de violence verbale contre les religions et l'utilisation de discours racistes. Le Parlement marocain, après l'initiative au nom de l'Assemblée parlementaire des États membres de l'OCI de proposer l'institution d'une journée des Nations unies contre l'islamophobie et l'intolérance, pour interpeller la conscience de la communauté internationale sur, sur le mauvais traitement subi par les musulmans à travers le monde. Merci de votre attention. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Mrs. Uri Kanyan from Armenia and the next speaker is Mr. Kirasoglu from Turkey. Uri Kanyan from Armenia? No? no? Okay. Then the floor goes to Mrs. Uh, Mr. Mehmet uh, Kirasoglu from Turkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is 
great pleasure to be here in Marrakesh, fascinating city, and I, I'd like to sincerely thank uh, Moroccan people and our Moroccan colleagues for their warm welcome and hospitality. Racism, xenophobia, hate speech, and intolerance are on a disturbing rise throughout the world, threatening our common democratic values as well as the peace and harmony of our societies. Muslims, Jews, Christians, and persons belonging to other religions and faiths are subject to widespread discrimination in many parts of the world. <coughs> Despite long-standing and intense efforts, anti-Semitism persists. Christians continue to face discrimination in some participating states. Islamophobia is on the rise. The terrorist attacks perpetrated in two mosques in New Zealand as well as, as the barbaric attacks in Sri Lanka and California tragically demonstrated that if strong measures are not taken, these alarming threats poison our societies and result in violent and terrorist acts. In many European countries, Muslims are the primary victims of discrimination, intolerance, hate crimes, and hate speech. Women, in particular, are more adversely affected by these trends and are, are often targets of xenophobic and Islamophobic attacks. I'd like to emphasize on the role of politicians and media in combating intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief. Populist politicians deliberately fool racism, xenophobia, and Islamophobia with their divisive language. These threats can no longer be ignored. They require urgent action both at national and international level. At the national level, legislative, administrative, and educational measures are needed, starting from addressing the root causes, showing solidarity with the victims, <coughs> as well as ensuring re re relevant data collection and reporting. Turkey actively, uh, actively contributes to the work of the UN, Council of Europe, and OSCE in this regard. We continue to play a leading role in international efforts combating racism, xenophobia, hate speech, and Islamophobia. We will continue to urge the international community to take effective measures against these dangerous trends and make sure that the issue remains a priority on the international agenda. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now the floor goes to Mrs. Sadiyokova from Tajikistan. And the next speaker, this is the last speaker on the list. And I will um, give Mr. Haliagyuk from Ukraine one minute to respond on the um, challenges from Russia, but only one minute. Mrs. Uh, Sadiokova from Tajikistan, the floor is yours. Уважаемый председатель, уважаемые коллеги, политические процессы, протекающие в современном мире, не следует рассматривать исключительно на локальном или даже региональном уровне. Начало 21 века сопровождается тяжелым политическим и экономическим кризисом, конечный итог которого в силу развивающихся конфликтных ситуаций в различных регионах мира становится непредсказуемым. Даже поведение людей в целом не соответствует не соответствует тому высокому уровню цивилизации, на которую мы претендуем. Экстремистские радикальные течения и порожденный им ИГИЛ, террористическая экстремистская организация партии Исламского Возрождения представляют огромную угрозу для нашей страны. Ведь потенциально угроза насильственного экстремизма существует во всех странах мира, в том числе и в развитых. Насильственный экстремизм не может проявляться в различных формах, будь то правый или левый экстремизм, сепаратизм или религиозный экстремизм, но его характерной чертой всегда является кровопролитие. Для решения проблемы профилактики и борьбы с нетерпимостью и дискриминацией на основе религии или убеждений необходимо использовать адекватные средства психологического и идеологического воздействия. Сегодня необходимо использовать этический код религии, так как он помогает людям заглянуть в свое подсознание и увидеть разные измерения его связи с явным и сокровенным поведениями и поступками отдельных личностей, пропагандировать те идеи религии, которые снабжают человека 
человечества основными, основами стабильного общества, прогресса, безопасности и мирного сосуществования, оберегает институт семьи, поддерживает принципы справедливости, самодостаточности, индивидуальной и коллективной ответственности, свободу убеждения и мысли, единство всего человечества в плане происхождения интересов и судьбы. И самое важное значение в борьбе против религиозного радикализма играет образование и наука. Воспитание религиозной терпимости по отношению к последователям иных вероисповеданий и инакомыслию в рамках той или иной религии, а также уважение к человеку, независимо от его расовой, конфессиональной, этнической или иной принадлежности, во многом зависит от воспитания в семье. На сегодняшний день важным направлением борьбы с нетерпимостью и дискриминацией на основе религии и убеждений является преодоление конфессиональных и религиозных противоречий. В этом направлении, наряду с возражением вышеназванных ценностей, также необходимо акцентрировать внимание на современную информационную войну. Отсюда важность сотрудничества органов государственной власти со СМИ. Необходимо формирование единого всемирного информационного пространства для борьбы против конфессиональных и политических противоречий. Государства, которые способствуют формированию насильственного экстремизма и радикализма, должны персонально отвечать перед международным сообществом. Созрело необходимое. Необходимо, чтобы рассматривая борьбу с нетерпимостью и дискриминацией на основе религии или убеждений, как приоритетную стратегическую задачу международное сообщество расширяло сотрудничество по предупреждению и пресечению экстремистских и террористических акций, совершенствовало механизм координации взаимодействия по укреплению международно-правовых основ и их противодействия. Весь этот процесс должен начинаться с каждого гражданина планеты, семьи, образовательных учреждений и государств. Хочу завершить свое выступление притчей Джалаладина Руми, который говорит, что в темноте разные люди, не видя слона, называют его по-разному. Я надеюсь, что данная наша конференция будет способствовать тому, чтобы зажгли свет на планете и политики, наконец-то договорились, чтобы мы посмотрели на мир другими, другими глазами и чтобы воссорилась мир, гармония, гуманизм и толерантность. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you. And now I give the floor for a short remark to Mr. Haliadyuk from Ukraine. One minute. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this opportunity to respond. President Zelensky and the Servant of the People Party want peace in Donbass and peace in Crimea, nothing more. It was specific promise to Ukrainian people made by both that we will make any effort, we will do anything that is in our power to establish peace. However, when people feel oppressed, when people feel that they cannot even do their prayers, do their worships because of their religion, religious beliefs, those efforts for peace are simply not very effective. That was why we urged the Russian Federation to take the necessary steps to restore the basic human rights, to restore the rights of these people to practice their religion peacefully. That is a very good ground for peace. Thank it was you. also commented that Ukrainian Thank government you. needs Your to... Your minute has gone. Thank you. I'm sorry. Your minute has gone. I will not open the floor to any further debate. Uh, we are going to Russia, you have the point of order? Нет, я прошу тоже краткую ремарку на одну минуту. One minute. Благодарю вас, господин председатель. Я хочу пригласить господина Галычука и любого члена парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ посетить э, Республику Крым регион Российской Федерации, чтобы убедиться, что все права верующих э, там соблюдаются и полностью обеспечены российским законодательством. Спасибо. Thank you. And thank you all for your contributions and for collaboration in performing this debate. We will now have some remarks for, from the uh, speakers at the panel, so I will give the floor to you, Mr. Belkabir. We, 
Merci, Madame la Présidente. C'est tout simplement quelques ajouts euh, concernant trois, trois euh, notes. Euh, la première des choses, on a un chute de la à l'aide de Sima Hamed, mais le barramal m'gribi, la diatar kadiyat, et à dat haïkalat, le haql dini, qui m'a yachos, le massajid, acteur min stimiet, stin elf massajid, ou imam, la haine, que l'oua toraka, min taraf, ou zarat, la oukaf, ou l'islamia. Le haql dini, ou aïda tartibu, min taraf, sahib, j'ai la amir, le mouminin, ou imarat, le mouminin, yamu assa, saka, et ma bidatia. Ou à kadalikal, Bah, euh, donc la, la réorganisation de, je tiens à ajouter sur ce qu'a dit si Mohamed du Parlement du Maroc concernant la restructuration du champ religieux euh, surtout sur la commanderie des, des croyants sa majesté roi qui est le commandant des croyants deuxième chose c'est l'instauration d'un institut de formation des imams et des morchidines et morchidettes. Les morchidines sont les prédicateurs et les prédicatrices qui se trouvent autour de, de la population pour l'encadrer. Deuxième chose, c'est je félicite les pays de l'Asie centrale. Euh, ils mènent un travail assez important et je, 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 je présente un témoignage euh, lorsque j'étais en 2018 à Kyrgyzstan. J'étais invité à Bishkek pour participer à une formation des directeurs des prisons de, de cinq pays relevant de euh, l'Asie la, la, centrale. Troisième chose, troisième ajout, euh, concernant le, le, la question qui, qui m'a été posée à propos de la femme et l'injustice qui se trouve, ou l'inégalité qui se trouve entre les femmes euh, au milieu rural et les femmes au milieu euh, urbain. Donc, le, 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 le Maroc a beaucoup fourni dans l'égalité des femmes. Et je peux citer quelques exemples. L'adoption de la Convention du SIDA. Deuxième chose, c'est l'instauration d'un ministère de la, de, de la femme et de la, de, de la, de, 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 de la solidarité. Troisième chose, les associations féminines. Quatrième chose, c'est le nouveau code de la famille qui a donné beaucoup d'importance à, 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 à la femme et au statut de la femme. Le, euh, surtout l'équité. La, la, le, 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 cinquième chose, la nouvelle loi qui euh, pénalise l'harcèlement sexuel. Et concernant cette inégalité entre, que nous, nous remarquons entre le milieu rural et le milieu urbain, ce n'est pas dû, il n'est pas dû au manque de texte, il n'est pas dû, et je parle sur le contrôle du, du Parlement marocain, ce n'est pas dû au, au, au manque de, de texte, au, au nom de l'application de texte, mais à, 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 aux traditions. Donc les traditions, c'est un obstacle, donc il faut qu'on implique les sociologues, les psychologues, les leaders religieux pour euh, con, con, convaincre les gens à donner à une bonne implication et implanter le, tout ce qui était donné dans le, venu comme nouveauté dans le code nouveau de la famille et dans les lois, euh, les nouvelles lois et la constitution nouvelle. Merci. Thank you very much. And now, Mr. Patachi, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, just... Uh, a couple of words. In fact, all speakers, all members of parliaments uh, stressed on the importance of combating intolerance. I can only be thankful to all members of, the, of their uh, respective parliaments of the OSCE uh, participating states who support combating intolerance and discrimination against Muslims and all uh, members of religions, religions in their countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will, before I conclude, I will just say that we have a technical uh, short uh, relocation after my conclusion, because Mr. President is uh, going to uh, conclude the whole uh, session. But I will just say that the discrimination and hate speeches and violence towards believers is increasing. 
That is something we all know. We are not finished. The increased hate speech and discrimination demands from every one of us action and willingness to listen and learn from each other. Today, we have had a small step forward, but we have more work to do, each of us in our own countries, when we get home. I will thank you, and I will now close this debate and give the floor to Mr. President Zeratel. Keep, keep your seats, please. Yeah. Is it morning still? Or no? Yeah, we have to wait a little bit. Good morning again, dear colleagues. Uh, before we finally conclude the session, uh, there will be also some interesting moments, not only speeches I know, but there will be also some video, the short, short film, short movie. And uh, we'll wait for this and then we'll say goodbye to each other. Okay, now we agreed on uh, an agenda for our closing.
just keep in this room for, for a while. I'd like to welcome uh, Speaker of the uh, Parliament, our good friend, Mr. Hakim Benchamash, and I'd like to ask him to say a few words at this session. شكرا سيد رئيس الجمعيه البرلمانيه لمنظمه الامن والتعاون في اوروبا ايتها الزميلات العزيزات ايها الزملاء الاعزاء كاين تجربه اود في نهايه اشغال هذه الدوره أن أجدد التعبير لكم جميعا باسم المملكة المغربية وباسم مجلس المستشارين الذي احتضن هذه الدورة أن أجدد لكم جميعا التعبير عن شكرنا وعن اعتزازنا بقوة هذه اللحظة التاريخية التي جمعتنا من آفاق مختلفة ومن مشارب مختلفة ومن خلفيات مختلفة لقد سعدنا كثيرا بغنى وثراء المناقشات التي دارت على مدى ثلاثة أيام بشأن هذه التحديات التي تسائلنا جميعا والتي يتعين أن نتصدى لها أريد أن ألفت الانتباه وأن أجدد التأكيد على أن البرلمان المغربي مصمم على الوفاء بالتزاماته وأن أجدد التأكيد على أن المغرب بلدي هو بلد جدير بالثقة بلد يحرص على الوفاء بالتزاماته والمغرب كما تعرفون يوجد في الصف الأمامي في هذه المعركة الضارية التي علينا أن نواصلها جميعا من أجل التصدي للمخاطر والتحديات التي ناقشناها والتي تحدثنا عنها المغرب كما تعرفون حضرات السيدات والسادة يعني كما قلت في مداخلتي خلال الجلسة الافتتاحية المغرب انتبه منذ وقت مبكر إلى مخاطر الاستسلام للفخ الذي سعى ويسعى الإرهابيون إلى جرنا إليه فخ المتمثل في تأجيل الإصلاحات الديمقراطية فخ تأجيل مهام توطيد البناء الديمقراطي والمغرب انحرط في الوقت نفسه وفي الآن نفسه في مجابهة التهديدات الإرهابية ولكن انحرط بكل شجاعة في إعادة بناء مؤسساته وفي إطلاق عدد من المشاريع ومن الديناميات الإصلاحية التي تروم توطيد تجربتنا الديمقراطية دعوني أعترف لكم منذ يعني منذ أكثر من سبع سنوات أتيحت لي فرصة الحضور في العشرات من الملتقيات ومن المؤتمرات الإقليمية والقارية والدولية وقد تحدثنا كثيرا عن هذه التحديات سواء التحديات المرتبطة بالتهديدات الأمنية والإرهابية أو التحديات الناشئة عن هذه التغيرات المتلاحقة في المناخ أو التحديات الناشئة عن تزايد موجات الهجرة غير النظامية 
وقد أشبع أشبعنا هذه المواضيع بحثا وتحليلا وتشخيصا دعونا نعترف اليوم بأنه آن الأوان لمباشرة العمل لاتخاذ القرارات الشجاعة فهذه التحديات كلما تأخرنا في مجابهتها من خلال سياسات عمومية ومن خلال قرارات سياسية كلما تضاعفت وكبرت تكلفتها الذي يشغل يشغل بالنا في المغرب ليس فقط هذا الجيل من التحديات التقليدية ولكن هناك جيل آخر من التحديات الجديدة وأدعوكم إلى التأمل في ماذا يعني أن تكون الفجوة ما دمنا تحدثنا عن حوض البحر الأبيض المتوسط أدعوكم إلى التأمل في ماذا يعني أن تكون الفجوة في معدلات التطور الاقتصادي وفي معدلات النمو بين الضفة الجنوب الشمالية للبحر الأبيض المتوسط والضفة الجنوبية تبلغ الآن بحسب أحدث تقارير حوالي نصف قرن الفارق في معدلات النمو بين شمال البحر الأبيض المتوسط وجنوبه هو نصف قرن أدعوكم إلى التأمل وإلى استحضار مخاطر التي تنطوي عليها هذه الحالة من عدم اليقين لانسيرتيتود حالة من عدم اليقين التي تخيم وتهيمن على قطاعات واسعة من شعوب شمال أفريقيا والشرق الأوسط وعندما أتحدث عن حالة عدم اليقين خصوصا المستشرية في صفوف الشباب الذين يشكلون 64% من الوزن الديموغرافي لهذه المنطقة فإنني أتحدث عن زحف خطير للإحباط عن انتشار خطير للإحباط وللتشاؤم وما دامت هذه الفجوات المتمثلة في الحرمان الاقتصادي وفي التهميش الاجتماعي وفي الاختلالات الموجودة في النظام الاقتصادي العالمي فعلينا أن لا نتفاجأ إذا كبرت هذه التحديات وإذا تفاقمت أكثر لقد تعلمنا هنا في المغرب أن وراء كل تحد توجد فرصة وراء كل التحديات التي تحدثنا عنها ثمة فرص للتقدم الأمام واليوم علينا أن نعترف بأنه يستحيل على أي دولة منفردة مهما كانت إمكانياتها ومهما كانت مواردها أن تواجه منفردة هذه التحديات من هنا الحاجة إلى التكامل وإلى العمل الجماعي نحن نراهن عليكم في الجمعية البرلمانية لمنظمة الأمن والتعاون في أوروبا أن تقودوا أن تحملوا مشعل تحويل الأقوال إلى أفعال وهذا ما ننتظره في المغرب شكرا جزيلا على حضوركم وسنسعد كثيرا للقاء بكم في مناسبات أخرى من أجل المزيد من العمل المشترك Please. Oh. Thank you very much, dear speaker. I have to say maybe a little bit more at this concluding moment of this conference. Dear colleagues, fellow parliamentarians, as this autumn meeting draws to an end, on behalf of the whole OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to our Moroccan hosts for their excellent organization of this autumn meeting. Thank you very much, uh, of course, uh, President Benjamin, and to all our friends in the PA delegation, as uh, Mohamed El Bakuri and Adelheim El Hams, and of course the, all the team. I also like to thank uh, first Vice Speaker, Vice uh, President, the Samad Keno, and uh, our dear friend Latifa El Hamoud for their great efforts. And, uh, of course, we also 
beyond our discussions here, enjoy the cultural touch you managed to give us of this beautiful country and people. And let us all give them a very warm round of applause, dear colleagues. And thank you, of course, you, my dear colleagues, members of the Parliamentary Assembly, for traveling to Marrakesh. Some of you, of course, traveled a long way and for very actively participating in all our productive discussions. It was hard to stack, and I'm very frank in this way. Yesterday, I had a talk with our Secretary General, and uh, he also the, pointed out that there was a competition a little bit to be stuck in this conference room with such a beautiful environment around us. But it is yet another sign of the commitment of our mission as elected representatives of our people. After three days of learning from each other and debating the way forward for the OSC region, and in particular for its Mediterranean component, we, now, we know that this conference has been very fruitful. You will find a paper, uh, where, although we are not uh, voting for any, any document here or on a or a resolution, but you will find a paper with conclusions uh, on the website. I would also like now to underline uh, just, just a few points. Promoting security across the Euro-Mediterranean region is not just a theme for our session. It is a concrete goal. I believe that uh, the OEC Mediterranean Partnership is very well placed to address the common challenges that we face on both shores of the Mediterranean. We need to further enhance this partnership and believe in it. Holding one of our statutory meetings in a partner country for the first time was surely an important sign in this direction. We have heard a wide range of views from experts, parliamentarians, OSC officials, and high-level representatives of this country with their rich history and traditions. The Mediterranean Forum of North-South Cooperation models, North -South cooperation models and economic connectivity led to an exchange of good practices between the OSC and African regional cooperation organizations. The conference also helped to better understand the challenges posed by climate change or migration for the Euro-Mediterranean region and underlined the necessity to combat intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief. We will continue to practice of having a special representative on Mediterranean affairs, acting as a special envoy and a focal point for our activities. This is, a, of course, a planned visit, which I informed you before, of uh, special representative Alizar to Egypt next month, and I welcome his participation in the OSCE Mediterranean Conference in Tirana in a few weeks. We welcome the engagement of MPs from Mediterranean partner countries in all our meetings and activities, including the work of three general committees or ad hoc committees, and of course, our main priority election observation missions. We will consider tabling a new document focusing on the Mediterranean partnership for our 2020 annual session in Vancouver, after 10 years of the Oslo Resolution. Dear colleagues, as I mentioned at our opening session, action is dearly needed to make the results of our discussion most meaningful. As we have seen in these days, during our vibrant and honest discussions, there are many challenges and divisions among us. But all the same time, but at the same time we also see the genuine will to overcome them, to change the reality and agree on possible solutions. The OSCPA is a very relevant forum for this, and I'm happy that during our standing committee yesterday, which was unusually long, our members again supported the idea to make this organization stronger, more effective, and more visible. As President, I'm ready to consider with the leadership of the Assembly 
and of course with the Secretary General and our Secretariat, all reasonable recommendations and ideas, also critical ones, raised during our meetings for instance, uh, those related to internal reforms, uh, conflict resolution, gender equality engagement, and of course engagement, uh, youth and civil society. It is crucially important that as we return home to our national parliaments, we carry on holding our governments accountable and pushing them to live up to their commitments. Parliamentarians have an important role to play to respond to challenges, encourage dialogue, the to the, and the pursuit of, uh, of multilateral diplomacy. Dear friends, before uh, concluding uh, my uh, remarks today, I wish to pay farewell, and you know about this, we also mentioned yesterday briefly, uh, about this issue, a farewell to three our colleagues, very dear colleagues that are unfortunately leaving the assembly after having done so much for it. So it's uh, Neil Sassana from Portugal, it's uh, Naima Landry from Belgium, and Alan Farrell from Ireland. So please, I'd like to invite all of you to the stage. That's a very pleasant part of, of this concluding session, but of course a little bit sentimental. Please. Uh, dear colleagues, thank you for this moment, but most of all, thank you for these years. It's, it was a long journey, uh, eight years in this international family. Uh, I was very happy to belong here because I learned a lot. I overcome my limitations. I mainly because, because I have the privilege to know amazing people uh, from many countries, for many parties. Thank you for all your support. And uh, I still believe strongly in the values of um, Helsinki Final Act. I think they are mainly important today with the new challenges that we are facing. And I'm truly convinced that you will continue this path uh, with the same energy and the same cooperation. I think efficiency and visibility are also important in this next cycle. I know efficiency is uh, already um, an achievement of this organization, and I think we can improve more and more visibility because we are efficient, but we need uh, to export for outside all the work, the extraordinary work that we do here inside, very tough, uh, with very many commitments, with many energy. So I think it will make the difference if we can be more um, listened to out, outside. So thank you very much. For me, it was an honor to serve here uh, as uh, president of the second committee and also as a vice president. And, uh, be committed as I was during these years. It was an honor, and thank you very much. Very short, dear colleagues. I also want to uh, 
Thank you very much for the nine incredible years I had the opportunity to work with you. Uh, also working uh, with you and getting to know you better and uh, we uh, have been fighting in our commissions but also in our working group for better rights, uh, human rights and I really hope and I'm also sure of it you will be continuing the good work, keep on the good work. Uh, thank you very much, merci à tout, tout le monde pour euh, tout ce qu'on a vécu ensemble, tout ce qu'on a pu réaliser ensemble. Et je vous souhaite vraiment euh, tout, euh, le meilleur euh, et encore beaucoup de chance en tout ce que vous faites. Merci, Chokran. Thank you very much, um, George. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I I'm very pleased um, actually to have made the decision to, to step away from the Parliamentary Assembly and is absolutely not a reflection upon you because I have learned so much from my six years of experience here, not just in um, promoting the principles of the Helsinki Final Act, but also um, meeting all of you and learning uh, what there is to be learned from you and from each other. It is a, a really important part of this assembly and what it stands for that from time to time as George referenced as our host referenced that we should listen to one another sometimes it's not necessarily about making a political speech which might be covered in your home country but that you actually might say something of value to those around you here at these assembly meetings um, I would like to conclude by thanking uh, our, our gracious hosts in Morocco for what has been a, a really pleasant experience I think you will all agree, and I very much look forward, um, if I am given the opportunity to do so by the Irish Parliament, uh, to welcoming you to Dublin for the 20th uh, autumn session of this Assembly in 2021. Thank you, and it's been a real privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, once again, of course, it was a great pleasure to work with you. Um, I hope that we will continue that. And uh, with this expertise and with this capacity, you will, I think, fulfill an important job in your own parliament or in other your endeavors. So we wish you all the best. And thank you very much, not only contributing to our work, but also contributing to the spirit, very friendly and collegial spirit of this organization and we will uh, have a keep we'll keep a very strong ties of course with you all the best to you and of course uh, dear colleagues at the end of our session a very special thanks to our staff behind the scenes so we are speaking here we are having discussions here we are giving interviews here and so on but there are people who are working very hard and I'd like to on behalf of you Thank all of them, the volunteers also, uh, who have been so, so helpful, our friends in our capable international secretariat with his leader, Roberto Montella, and they did a really excellent job. It was not easy to organize this meeting, and our staff traveled a few times to Morocco. And of course, uh, we are concluding this meeting, but we'll meet very soon in Vienna for our winter meeting. I look forward to continue the dialogue and cooperation and work with you and wish all the best. Safe trip back. Safe trip back. And uh, again, thank you very much for your very hard work and good cooperation here in Morocco. Thanks. Please. The President wants to say something. Uh, dear uh, colleagues, if you allow me, and now we have a symbolic present to offer to Mr. President and to Mr. Uh, Secretary General. And, uh, oh, but, uh, we didn't know. <laughs> so, oh, this is, uh, hmm? Okay. More important papers. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Okay. Thank you. Well, we can stay in this room and continue, but uh, our meeting is concluded. Thank you very much. Shukran, and see you soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. That's a short video, so you can you can also enjoy that.